Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. May we all stand and pledge our allegiance to a great country reflected in our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're on TV6. Um, is the Globe Girl Emily? I don't see her yet. Okay, I would ask anyone who has a cell phone to please be sure that it's silenced. And if you have availed yourself of coffee, I uh, would ask that you have a lid on your coffee. And if you don't have a lid, please put one on because we're trying to keep our boardroom um, wonderful. All right. Um, approval of the agenda. Request to speak. Okay. Judith? Uh, I'd like to change 13B and move it up directly after the consent calendar before we do unfinished business of 12 so right. that uh, we can take care of a lot of the people in the room. Move 13B, which is the item on the RV rate increase, and take it right after the consent calendar, so between 11 and 12. I second. Okay, do we have consensus on that? All right, so we'll do that. Any other um, comments regarding the agenda? All right, so approval of the agenda. Do we use so, this? So approved. <laughs> and the globe has arrived. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The next item on uh, is the approval of the minutes for August 1st, August 9th, and July 5th. I so move. Oh, j I'll second. Okay, it was moved by Diane Phelps and seconded by Catherine Freshley to approve the minutes of August 1st, August 9th, and July 5th. All right, any objection? Yeah, Joan. Yeah, Joan? I have some minor scribners. Okay. Um, on, the, uh, on page three of eight, agenda item 5A, um, under number 12, should read, entertain a motion to approve, not approval. And uh, I think that was the main thing. Okay. And I think that was my main. Oh, on uh, page three of eight on item 5C, Excuse me, two of eight on uh, item 5C uh, under eight CEO report. Just the third line down, Clubhouse one should be capital C and just the number one, just for consistency. And on page three of eight, under the resolution, uh, first paragraph, whereas. Formats for broadcasting originating, uh, the, the second line down under the uh, resolution. Originating as opposed to originating. As, as opposed to originated. Okay. And under the next whereas, take out the as. So whereas technology instead of whereas as technology. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if you leave it. And uh, the final one was 
On the next whereas, take out the and in the la end of the paragraph. On page uh, four of eight, next page. Under the third, whereas, under the resolution, <coughs> the third line down, again, it should be establish, not establishing, to fully establish riparian. Page five of eight. Uh, I, I put a comma instead of the colon, uh, semicolon, after authorize the second line down. Okay, fussy, fussy. Okay, that's it, thank you. All right, any further corrections? Okay, so all in favor of approving the uh, minutes. I think we have a screen, so we can actually vote. Okay, cease voting. All right, so the minutes are approved. Okay. All right, the next item on the agenda is the report of the chair. And the first thing I would like to do is to welcome Cheryl Silva. She is now officially our corporate secretary, and um, that seat's been kind of musical chairs, <laughs> but we think we got a winner this time, so thank you, Cheryl. Um, I would like to comment on the, our landscape. I feel that the constant letters to the globe is like somebody hitting a kid in the schoolyard and everybody piling up on them. Um, my background, I've been pushing lawnmowers since I was 11 years old. My father was a gardener, and I was expected when I was not in school to be his number one helper. I went to college. I worked all my summers in college for a landscape contractor. My degree is in landscape architecture. I taught ornamental horticulture for 30 and a half years, and in teaching that, I also taught my students how to maintain um, plant material in the landscape. And I just feel that it's become the thing to do to complain about our landscape. And when I drive around this community, I'm not saying that things couldn't be better. Things can always be better. But when I drive around and I look at the acreage that we have and the number of people that we have to do the work, I feel, and, and the circumstances that have happened within the last year and a half or so regarding weather, um, I think our people are doing a good job. And I would like to see them complimented instead of being beat up. Um, my brother has a large contracting landscape contracting business. And I happened to have dinner with him last Thursday. And one of the things that he was mentioning is how difficult it is to get help. <clears throat> the usual pool of labor that was typically willing to work in the landscape doesn't want to do that kind of work anymore. And when you look at a week like we've just had, the last 10 days or so, how would you like to be out in that weather um, doing manual physical work? Um, so my brother's gone as far as going to consulates to make them aware that he has job openings for people coming into the country. Um, that's how critical the employment situation is becoming in the landscape industry. Um, I have a neighbor, Linda Vine, and she said to me one day, you know, I walk, and she's one of these people that listens to books on tape and walks probably miles every single day in our community. And she says, I just look at the trees flowering and the, she commented about when the agapanthus, the big groups of agapanthus, and she said, I just look at the pretty stuff. And I guess what she's really saying is I focus on the positive, not the negative. So we, as part of uh, our CEO comments today, 
have asked um, Brad to ask Kurt Ron, who's the director of the landscape department, to speak and um, to enlighten the community on some of the issues he's been dealing with in, in the maintenance and of our landscape. And one last comment I'll make is I drive on, um, well, there's a couple of streets I drive on. I don't even know the name of them I drive on. They're outside the community. But these are major thoroughfares where trees went down in the storm, primarily pines. And on those slopes are still the stumps of those trees that went down. And that's a commercial landscape. That's, that's an HOA situation. You don't see that in our community because our tree people got in there and dealt with it immediately. So um, enough said about that. I will turn it over to um, Lucy Scheiman, our VMS representative. Good morning, Lucy. Good morning, everybody. V VMS is a very busy place. We had three meetings this last month. Normally, we're down to two a month. And because there was a third Wednesday, we got to meet for a third time. We covered a lot of ground in that period. On the first meeting, on the second, we heard from Chuck Holland about everything that's been going on in IT. And if you are on the uh, village news, the breeze and so on, you would have seen pictures. And you, there's been a lot of publicity for all the things they did, the new um, Well, there's a new website. I'm thinking of, of the big physical item. Satellite, thank you. Uh, but anyway, the very interesting report on all of the things that happened. Then on the 16th, we heard from Brian Gruner. He of Recreation, who put on the 4th of July special and has pepped up our meetings and things that we have in the new Performing Arts Center. And things have really been improved, different, and more exciting here than they have been in prior years. He seems to be a great, enthusiastic, friendly recreation director or entertainment <laughs> director. So I'm just thrilled with the kind of employees that we have been able to, to get for the department heads and the people that are in charge of each department. Uh, on the, at the end of the month, our topic was handyman survey. And seems to be, in, at least where we are, a lot of enthusiasm toward the idea. Now, the, the plan at this point is to have a meeting between United and Third and VMS. I guess GRF gets in there too if they want to. And, and plan what is needed for Handyman. We have pirated the entire uh, records and plan and services that uh, Rossmore has used and got, used that as a basis for what we would provide with whatever input we can get from here of things that are overlooked or we don't need that, this is more than we want. Uh, the response to the uh, survey was very positive. There were 2,600 responses and Brad and staff seemed to feel that if we had 1,000 people interested, it would be uh, numerically able to be done. So it, it, it can be a go, but we want to get as much input as we can. It's the, the answer 
should be by the end of October as to what we could do, when we'll do it. I would, the aim is for the first of the year to try and have a handyman service. Uh, the sentiment seems to be toward having in-house employees, people that would wear our uniform and you know, make us feel comfortable with having them come into our homes. We're still looking for, for ideas of what you need or want or are interested in having. And I think the number of visits per year, the fee was yearly that was discussed, and the amount and the frequency and things like that are to be determined by this committee that will be formed or has been. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Any questions of Lucy? All right, thank you. The next item on our agenda is the report of our CEO, Brad Hudson. I'll be uh, brief today <coughs> to allow uh, Kurt ample time to discuss landscape issues, but it's always a pleasure to come before your board and the community and talk about things that are going on. Kind of an interesting weekend. Um, I always know if Chuck or Lori is the executive on duty it's going to be busy. I don't know why. And, and sure enough, we had a power outage, uh, gate 14. Lori was on scene for that. And luckily, it wasn't as hot as it had been in prior days. because It was quite lengthy. And then we apparently, we had some sort of a wasp uh, invasion over the weekend. And so we were dealing with that. Just a number of issues. The long weekends always bring it out. I don't know why. And uh, I want to thank Lori and, and our security staff for uh, being on the ready. Uh, this weekend and taking care of that. This was also the first week, and if you recall, those of you on the, uh, the Transportation uh, Committee know that uh, this was the weekend we were starting Sunday and holiday and the holiday for uh, no uh, fixed route transit service, but only on demand. And so we did demand response Sunday and Monday. Uh, went very well. We were able to transport everyone who requested a ride. There were some people who uh, apparently didn't get the word that, that we had switched uh, from fixed route to on uh, demand response service, um, though we, I think we had about a six-week marketing effort, including flyers on the buses, and I think there was something in the breeze, and we, we did, uh, I know Becky Jackson was on TV three or four times, so um, I think we, we did a, a pretty good effort getting the word out. You can always communicate a little bit better, but by and by, um, we were able to, to uh, reduce cost, provide a much better service, you know, door-to-door -door service as opposed to getting on a fixed route and driving around the community to get to the store, and then also getting, you know, uh, 10 diesel buses off the streets of our village for a couple of days is a good thing as well. So I think a uh, good first run, we'll, there's lessons to be learned. We'll do better uh, next time around, but uh, which will be next Sunday, so we don't have much time to prepare for it. So this is the wave of the future. It's not in fixed route transit, it's in demand response. I wanna just, I know the budget's on your agenda, just take another opportunity to say a, a thank you to the residents and, and board members, staff who, who worked on the budget. It was, it was a very lengthy process and, and I think a, a pretty good one. We continue to, uh, to work diligently on a number of small projects while in the planning process for a couple of big ones. Uh, notable uh, are a number of restroom projects around the community where we've taken some pretty dilapidated uh, rest, uh, restrooms and trying to bring them up to standards. Um, we start Gatehouse uh, 8 next week. Again, small project, but it'll be important for those that work there. A lot of... Uh, uh, paving and slurry going on. I, I, I think we did all of United. I don't know. Every time I drive over there, I'm on a fl freshly slurried road. So a lot of work going on there. We launched the website last week. Um, we look forward to hearing everyone's <coughs> comments. I, I think there was 30,000 page, pages, uh, mostly transferred over, some changed. Uh, probably a lot of mistakes in there. And so we encourage uh, residents and board members and staff to to in your spare time, uh, enjoy a little uh, little browsing. And if you see things that, that don't look right, let us know. There's a webmaster uh, email address on there and, and we'll uh, make uh, appropriate corrections. 
And then we continue to, to make uh, a lot of changes and improvements to, uh, to Village Television. Uh, we've added some, some new equipment and new sets and other things, and I think it's really looking uh, quite snappy. And we have some new programming as well that we've been unleashing. So I'm very excited about what's going on with Village Television and, and how it's going to uh, serve our community for years to come. So with that, I'll take any questions or hand off to Kurt. I just wanted to um, I had some questions over the weekend about the new bus changes. You're calling it demand service, but don't you still need 24 hours notice to catch the bus? Because they would not pick people up on Monday for like the lawn bowling tournament unless they had called the day before. So wasn't the name a little deceiving? Maybe we need to communicate that more, that it's still a 24-hour notice. You still have to get, yeah, the demand response program. I think we waive that this weekend and actually not monday no that whoever was answering the phone on monday would not come oh huh. i was told they transported curious. everybody who requested a, a ride for the weekend but i'll double check that and report back but yeah it's still it is still you need to make make an appointment in advance to be picked up but i think we can have some flexibility there as well if we have capacity so we'll talk to drew about that and report back Well, good morning. Take copies of what the person's going to talk about. We'll let those go ahead and get passed out here. But um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Chair Parker, thank you for your comments. I really appreciate that. And thank you to the board members here today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak with you and let you know some of the challenges that we've been faced with in the landscape department. Uh, I speak to numerous, numerous residents on a daily basis, and one of the comments that I hear repeatedly after I've explained... I'm trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, let me speak into the microphone here. Um, again, I, I speak to numerous, numerous residents on a daily basis, and one of the reoccurring themes and comments that I hear from them uh, after I've explained our situation, and I, I really have to say a, a big thank you to those residents for being very understanding. Uh, as we explain our circumstances, they really do understand what we're going through. And one of the things that they suggest to me is that we need to do a better job of, of communicating. And I completely agree with that, and it's, it's wonderful to have this opportunity to, to do that so that we can get out in front of the community like this and explain some of the challenges that we've been faced with. I don't want to take up uh, a great deal of your time today, but I do have a number of slides that, that we can go through um, and just explain the challenges that we've been faced with, the things that we're doing to tackle those challenges, and where we go uh, going forward. So if we could advance the slide there. I'll start out with some statistics about our acreage. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview of the, the size and magnitude of, of the job that we have here, we have over 640 acres irrigated. That uh, does not include the golf course. That would be above and beyond that. We have eight grounds crews of approximately 10 men that manage the care of those 640 acres. Uh, we have, according to our latest count with our new Arbor Pro system, we have over 35,000 trees. And when you do the simple math on that, with a 32 to 34 month cycle, we're looking at over 1,000 trees a month that we need to review and, of course, uh, do the service as necessary. Go ahead. All together, we have 155 total staff years on our budget. And again, as I mentioned, we have eight grounds crews that manage the... Um, the shrub beds and the, and the lawns and just the overall care of the grounds out there. Uh, those crews are approximately 10 staff each. Now the challenge that we've been faced with uh, this year that we've not been uh, challenged with in the past, at least not to this degree, is our staffing. Uh, as John mentioned, it's been very, very difficult to fill some of the open positions that we have. Going into the growing season this year, at one point we had 11 positions that we needed to fill. Seven of those were budgeted normal openings and four were additional uh, positions that we were going to bring in to deal with renovation work that we were doing in United for a particular project in Colasacs 8 and 40. Uh, going into the growing season, 
we were not able to fill those positions, so essentially we ended up absorbing that work, which impacted the, uh, our ability to keep up with uh, normal maintenance. In addition to that, I don't know how many people are familiar, but here in California we have the FMLA, which is um, Family Medical Leave Act, where employees can take time off to deal with um, illnesses within the family. We have a number of staff that are taking, uh, you know, utilizing that uh, benefit to them. Uh, when you put this all together at one point, we were down essentially an entire grounds crew. So instead of having eight grounds crews, we were really operating with about seven grounds crews. Um, and, and as John pointed out, really the, the main driver of this is the unemployment rate here in Orange County. It's very, very difficult here in Southern Orange County to fill these positions. Unemployment is low. In addition to that, because these are entry level positions, you don't have, um, you know, the, it's very difficult for folks to move into the area and live in the area. So oftentimes they have to come from distances. And if they can find a job in their own neighborhood, then it's much easier, obviously, for them to do that. On top of this, we've had a number of new hires, about a dozen new hires since November. Obviously, new hires have a learning curve that they need to get up, and so they're not as productive and, and effective and as, as efficient as a seasoned employee. So that adds to um, our ability to keep up with the workload. One, one other item that I want to point out um, that impacted us, particularly this year, it's a new training protocol uh, for work on slopes. It's fall protection training uh, that it became a new requirement this year for us to go through. And it's a great thing to have. It was definitely necessary. Obviously, we want to keep our, our staff safe in the field out there. But the timing of it was the problem. And so we were, ordinarily, we would be working on the slopes in the non-growing season, which is the winter in spring and in the fall. Uh, we weren't able to do some of the work that we would ordinarily do because we didn't have the training in place. There's also equipment that we needed to purchase and get on hand. Uh, for them to be able to, to um, do the job safely. And so the, the timing of that threw us off and we weren't able to do some of the work that we needed to do. Uh, we're also working with Orange County Fire Authority and I'll get into that in some, some slides here. Uh, but we weren't able to do some of the work that they needed us to do uh, in the non-growing season and it was pushed to the growing season which then detracted from our ability to, um, to maintain, uh, just, ju just to do the, the normal maintenance. Go ahead and advance there. The next uh, major challenge has been the rain, and John alluded to this as well, the, the weather conditions that we had. And I, I think we would all certainly agree the rain has been a blessing. We've gone through about five years of drought, uh, and having normal rainfall has certainly been a blessing. I can see across the landscape, the health of the landscape is so much better, not only here in the village, but really everywhere. Um, and so it's been a blessing to have that. However, it does come as sort of a double-edged sword, and that is obviously when we had the rain and the wind in the non-growing season, uh, our crews were busier and more affected by that, the cleanup work uh, that was necessary as a result of that, which then prevented us from doing some of the corrective pruning, some of the slope work that we would have done in the areas where we could do that without the training. Uh, things like that. And so we were not able to do the work in the non-growing season that would have set us up for a better time during the growing season. So that was one part of that. But what the rain has really done here, particularly after five years of drought, has really flushed out the soil. Uh, there's been an accumulation of salts in the soil when you don't have the normal rainfall to flush that out. Our irrigation water comes with a high degree of salinity to it. And so as a result, you have a buildup of salt that suppresses plant growth. So when you have the rain flush that out, it, again, it adds to the health of the plants and we saw a tremendous response in terms of the growth of the plant material from weeds to trees and everything in between. It's been a very strong growth response and that's all across the board, everywhere, all at once. It's very, um, it, it added, or compounded the problems that we were having uh, being short-staffed. Um, one of the other items, or one of the other um, things that it caused was us to begin our weekly mowing sooner than what we would normally do. 
which again detracts from our ability to do normal shrub bed maintenance because the manpower is shifted from that to the mowing operation. When it comes to the trees, we have a number of trees that produce seeds and various fruits and whatnot that create a litter problem. Well, with the rain and all the growth that we've received, those trees put on a, a heavy crop of seeds. Uh, there's a number of, of trees that we have that are fast growing. Many of the trees that we have are placed very close to buildings. And so you start to get growth that is impacting the structure, rubbing against windows and roof lines and that sort of thing, which has led to a, a spike in the calls that we've received for off schedule pruning and it detracts from our ability to keep up with the normal uh, routine pruning that we need to do. Back to that thousand trees per month that we need to keep up with. Go ahead and advance there. Here's just a picture of showing you some of the shrub growth that we're dealing with, just to, as examples here. Um, you can see, particularly on the left, the type of growth that impacts the driveways and walkways and, and people's ability to get in and out of their manors. Uh, this, the growth that you see on, this, on the plants here is about two months worth of growth. So if we were firing on all cylinders, everything was working to our, to our favor as it has been in the past, our normal cycle rate is about every two months. So you can see with this kind of growth, even if we were firing on all cylinders, we would have a very difficult time keeping up with the workload. Go ahead. Here's an example of, of uh, issues that we have with grass. Now, uh, we have, as has most of Orange County, been colonized by kikuyu grass. This is a weed species of grass. It's a warm season grass, which means it prefers the hot, warmer months for uh, rapid growth. It is very aggressive. And when we've had the years of drought that we've had, what that has done is it's tipped the scales in favor of kikuyu. And so we have much more of it in the community here. And you can see how it, it encroaches into the shrub bed. So now we have to do much more string line trimming. You can see the picture on the right, how aggressive it is. It actually grows on the top of a, of a post here uh, in a park in uh, Northern Orange County. Go ahead and advance there. So the slopes, uh, again, that the health of the plant material is so much better. The condition of the plants, particularly on the slopes, looks so much better. But again, you can see the growth here. These are, these are slopes that would have been groomed last fall. And again, in the spring, we were not able to do it in the spring. And so you can see the growth now that we have to deal with coming into the fall here uh, to get that back under control. Go ahead. Here's an example of trees. The tree on the left is already impacting the roof line. That is a ficus tree. It's very close to the buildings there. That was pruned about two years ago. Our normal cycle rate is approximately three years, as I mentioned before. There's no way that tree can go another year without some pruning being done. So we have to pull guys off schedule to deal with that. On the right, you can see the heavy fruiting there of the uh, carrot wood and the mess that it's dropping there. You can see that the, the seeds are so heavy, it's actually, they're actually bending the, the branches down. Again, that's, that's all um, work that needs to be dealt with off schedule which impacts our ability to keep up with the workload. Go ahead. Other factors, as I mentioned, we've been working with the Orange County Fire Authority. The western perimeter of the community is within the OCFA's ember zone, and so there's certain, um, certain uh, parameters that they would like to see in terms of vegetation on that side of the community. One of their main concerns is the amount of acacia that is planted. On the slopes, acacia has a, an oil that is flammable, and so OCFA would prefer that that's cut back or, or even eliminated. And so again, with the training that we needed to get through in the spring, we weren't able to deal with some of the work that they needed us to do. It was pushed to the summer, the growing season, which then impacted our ability to keep up with the workload. Another item, I'm not sure, I, I'm pretty sure it has been talked about in past URF meetings, but. In case you're not aware, um, the AQMD has tightened their regulations when it comes to um, diesel exhaust and emissions, uh, particularly from our tub grinder. And so our tub grinder actually no longer complies and it was taken out of service. We're in the process of trying to um, determine how to go about, how best to go about replacing that with a, a machine that would be compliant. 
the net result of that has been that we haven't been able to produce the mulch that we would normally produce, which of course, if we had been able to do that and then put that out in the spring would have helped us with our weed control. We've had a number of unplanned um, jobs that have come up that are largely out of our control. And one example here is Southern California Edison's work within the gates five and six area. Go ahead and advance the slide there. Um, here's an example of the slope I was talking about, OCFA on the western perimeter over by Barbara's Lake. If you're familiar with that side of the community, uh, you can see the acacia there and that all has to be removed. That impacts not only the grounds crew, but it also impacts the tree crew because we utilize the tree crew to do the grinding. Also those palms that you see are actually outside the wall, the perimeter wall of the community, but it is on community property. It's uh, one of those areas where the wall is actually set back inside the, the property line. And so the OCFA wanted those palms removed. And so we had to work with the park on the other side there to get in there and uh, remove those palms, which have been removed. But we had to do that during the summer here, again, impacting our ability to keep up with the workload. Go ahead. Now, these are priority two slopes. Just, again, example of the acacia that we're talking about that we need to thin out or reduce or even eliminate. Now, OCFA has been working with us on these slopes, and they're willing to go ahead and wait until the fall for us to be able to do these. So that's, that actually works in our favor. Go ahead to the next one. Now, the Southern California Edison has been working in gates five and six, working on their utilities. I believe they're replacing some of their power lines out there. And obviously, the work that they do is very damaging to the landscape. Now, they're supposed to do the cleanup and repair work, but obviously, they, they don't do the repair work to the full extent that we would like to see. So we're the ones that have to come back in and fix this the way that it should be fixed. And again, that detracts from our ability to keep up with routine maintenance. Go ahead. So where we stand right now, obviously with grounds maintenance, we need to fill our positions. We have four positions left currently that we need to fill. Uh, our human resources has been doing a great job trying to recruit staff in here to, uh, to fill those positions. I believe we have two or three actually in the works that we hope will be here in the next week or two. Um, one of the other things, and, and thanks to Brad for his um, uh, authorization here to use overtime, particularly on the weekends through August, that helped tremendously for us to get some of this work taken care of. And we've really kind of mixed up how we do the work, emphasizing more off-schedule pruning, trying to go out and deal with uh, the problems that, that folks have at their manors, rather than just focusing on the normal progression of our cycles. We, we need to get out there and take care of people that have been uh, waiting for months and months for the service to, uh, to take place. And so um, that's, that's kind of the direction we've been taking with grounds maintenance. When it comes to tree maintenance, one of the things that we're doing is we've created an off-schedule team where we can take just a few guys and have them go and deal with the off-schedule work, all of the uh, calls that we receive where trees are rubbing up against buildings and that sort of thing, so that, that the main bulk of the crew will continue to, um, to handle those 1,000 trees a month that they need to handle. Also, one of the things that we're going to do here um, is with our new Arbor Pro system, there were trees that were identified as what we call priority one removals. They need to be removed right away. And so this off schedule team will be dealing with those. That will be less work than that the tree crew needs to deal with as they progress with their cycles. So that should help. Also a big thanks to Christine Spar and, and her folks there in resident services. We've been working closely with them, uh, trying to communicate where we're at so that they can help us to communicate with, with uh, the community as they're receive, receiving those calls from folks. Now, the silver lining in all this is that as we progress here into the fall, uh, things will slow down. The plant growth is already slowing down. I, I would say uh, we're in that uh, as we speak now, and it seems like the heat has broken. Uh, the days are shorter and cooler, so that will certainly assist us to get back on track. And I know. I, I'm hearing from my staff, they're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. At many places, we should be caught up uh, by late September, early October. Other areas, it'll take us a little bit longer. But once we get caught back up, particularly at this time of the year, particularly with the positions being filled, we should be able to stay caught up. Go ahead. And then the last thing here that I wanted to go over is where are we going from here? And that is, I would like to work uh, with HR and continually recruit. I think it would be good for us to develop a, a backlog, if you will, 
of applications, even perhaps if we don't have positions that are open, it would be good to have applications on file that we can go to right away to try to cut down on some of the time to fill these vacancies. Uh, we'll continue to, to train and develop staff, and, and really the supervisors, my hat's off to our supervisors. They have done a great job with these new employees coming in here, working individually with those guys, trying to get them up to speed with the expectations uh, that we um, that we expect that they would put into the work here. Doing a great job, we'll continue to do that and, and improve upon our staffing. Um, we've done this for years and years. We will continue to do that, to, to do this, and that is to replace the high maintenance shrubbery, uh, particularly during the painting process. That's a great time where we can go in and address concerns with the shrubbery um, and identify those plants that are giving us the most difficulty in maintaining and we can work with the residents that live in those areas to remove and replace. Obviously we want to replace with with uh, lower maintenance plant material and drought, to drought tolerant plant material uh, that will work well for us going forward. Um, we will utilize the Arbor Pro system to identify what we call cycle busters and again those are those trees that are very fast growing or because of their location, their species and their situation in the landscape out there cause us to have to pull off of our normal maintenance and spend time to deal with them outside of the normal cycle. And so we're working with that system to identify the best way to, um, to address those so that we can progress more efficiently. And then lastly, again, to do a, a better job of communicating with the residents through resident services, through the globe, through emails and, and the, the e-blast and um, the breeze, and, and actually I want to thank Lori and her staff for helping us with that. And so I'll take a quick breath, and if anybody has any questions for me. I don't have a question, but I want to compliment you. You talk about uh, listening to people and going out to their residences. You just recently went to my place on a couple of issues, and they've already been addressed. Um, I also, just a thought, Having been a fire investigator, I had a situation in my place with pine trees where the pine de needles fall down and they cause a real, real problem. If there is a situation, it would uh, in enhance the fire. So what I've done is I assured him, I do every week myself because of the piles of it. I put a, pull it away from myself and anything we can do to help his crew is really something. Also, like uh, one guy, uh, one of the gentlemen couldn't finish what situation. I took a broom and swept up a little bit of area. No big deal. And, and like I said, he, he absolutely listens to what you have to say and does take care of things. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Catherine? Yeah, I want um, thank you very much for the report. I think it's helpful, and I hope many of the residents will observe and and try to understand the, the issues that we've had relative to the landscaping because we all are hearing about it and we're reading about it. But I think one of the things that uh, most of us don't realize, my mic is on, is uh, the FMLA, the family leave thing, is in the law. And so whenever an employee is out on family leave, we still pay them for the next 12 weeks. So it becomes kind of an issue then to say, well, can we get some temporary people or get some people in to replace them? And it becomes a challenge because then you double your payroll. And if we're really trying to you know, manage to a budget, it becomes then really a balancing act of really trying to make sure that we're maintaining the costs in the community because it affects all of us and balancing it with what the law requires us to do and to really reach a compromise. And, and now they're working the overtime, which uh, will hopefully allow us to catch up, even though we may have the open positions and we still have to abide by the law with the FMLA. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to thank Kurt for his presentation. I think it might help. Um, inform people of the difficulties that you've been working under. And I've served on the United Board and I've served on GRF twice, but in, in all of those situations, I was involved with um, the Landscape Committee. And um, 
since my initial contact with the landscape department, a supervisor that was here for 48 years, Nine. 49 years, retired. Um, a couple positions were eliminated. So not only in the workforce, but just in the time that I've been on boards, <coughs> which is three years or so, um, it's almost a whole new staff, a whole new set of faces in the landscape department. I think all to the good, but there is that catch up, learn the ropes time, and that combined with some unusual circumstances like the drought, the end of the drought, hmm. et cetera. So thanks, thanks a lot, Kurt. Uh, Tom. Yeah, in support of Kurt, I'm gonna ask Brad and Lori to get with Southern Cal Edison and to make them do proper cleanup when they do a project within Laguna Woods. There's absolutely no reason why our personnel have to go in and spend any time cleaning up another agency's work. Uh, clearly, we need to do a better job of making them do their job in support of Kurt. Thank you. Um, Kurt, did DRF give you money for the new, a new mulch maker? I, or is that being fixed? Because that seems to have dominoed into a couple of things. Because <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> it's two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's. You still need to do it. And we're we're um, looking to get that permitted before we actually <laughs> buy it. Correct. Because there is a risk you could purchase it and then AQMD could refuse to permit it, and so. The air quality management district permits are being sought prior to ac acquiring the, the asset. I, I should have added, we did bring in a contractor to help us with our backlog of, of work, and they did quite a bit of work for us. We still have more that we need to do, but that was helpful to generate some mulch that we can use this year. Thank you. All right. So now we come to that part in our <laughs> agenda, which is the open forum. And the way this works, I see some people who are not regular attendees at the meetings, but um, we ask that you state your name and manner number slowly so that the secretary can, can get it. And then in this part of the meeting, you may address topics that are not on the agenda. So for instance, I see a large contingent of RV people um, we've moved that item up on the agenda, but now would not be the time to address the RV since it is on the agenda. And we do limit the time to three minutes. So, please. My name is Tony Dower, 96C, Cali, Aragon. I just wanted to say that thanks to my dogs, I had an early walk at 645 on Sunday and saw a beautiful rainbow off to the southwest side and a few drops of rain. So I'm looking forward to the drought finally getting less problem. As far as I'm concerned, people don't usually complain or compliment if something is going good. But they just complain if there's been some notion of something not going good. So I just say the landscaping committee has always listened to my suggestions. And I would hope other people make suggestions and not just write a letter of complaint. Have they contacted the landscaping? I'd like to see a phone number put up on the board for where they could call to be sure someone will listen to them and not just business properties that might leave a voicemail and they never know back what's going on. Um, also, we noticed that our costs at City Hall are going up tremendously due to them thinking they need to hire more police or something. How about our investigators? Do they do the job that the police are already doing twice? Maybe uh, our investigators can do more and they won't think they have to spend so much money on police. Um, also, a small suggestion, I've been in Clubhouse 5 cutting through a shortcut through the, lawn, uh, the uh, kitchen, and you have an old pilot light system, two or three times the size of my pilot lights I used to have. Now, when I had a gas stove 15 years ago, it had instant light. Maybe you ought to consider getting rid of those old pilot lights, because it gets kind of warm in there, and it's always dangerous to have gas on all the time for use 1% of the time. Also, I hope you will be responsible to watch out for the dog park's future. 
if you can help in any way, make sure take over from City Hall if they won't do their job. And also, finally, I want to suggest that two or three hundred of us are very happy with the way things are in Clubhouse Three. We have eight billiard tape, no, six billiard tables in there that are wonderful. We played there for a long time. My friends and I play there every Monday morning. I would certainly hope somebody doesn't think we need another rehearsal room, because where are you going to put six billiard tables? You're not going to have Clubhouse 5 or 7. Also, if someone here is a performer in the auditorium, I would suggest that they recuse themselves from any kind of vote on getting rid of it. You don't need to spend money on an analyst to tell you what you already want to do. Let me just suggest you're going to offend a lot of people if you close that billiard room and stick us over in some place in Clubhouse 1. And what's going to happen to those people there that are using that room that you want to take over. So thank you, and have more concern about not doing anything, because if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Hello, my name is Barbara Sanchez, 2105Q, Rhonda Granada. I just have a suggestion and um, on the landscaping issue. I happen to have an outside contractor come in and help trim some trees. He's someone I've worked with for 25 years. So while he was here, I mentioned to him that I thought there were landscape openings. And he was interested. He has a son and a, some friends that he thought might be interested. So when one of the landscape crew came by, he walked over and talked with them. He speaks Spanish, so they were communicating clearly. And um, he asked about openings. And the landscape crew member said, I don't think there are any. He said, I don't know of anybody that's left or any openings that are available. So if that person just happened to be the one uninformed person, I guess that was just bad luck. But I would suggest that we make sure that our landscaping crew is well aware of what the openings are, what the requirements are, and what benefits are available to new hires. Thank you. My name's Ernie Reynolds, 28C Castilla. <coughs> and Mr. Parker, I know who you are. I don't think you know who I am. I'm the former president of Linish and Reynolds, Reynolds Environmental Group, Environmental Analysis Foundation, landscape architect in 1958, by examination, one of the first landscape architects licensed in the state of California, and I admire the work that you're doing here, and I also understand some of your problems. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to make a couple, three comments. Um, my family, my uncle, retired Navy captain, came here in the late 60s. I knew the people with Ross Cartesi that did this project. I planned Nellie Gale next door. I also had a mother that came down and father, and they were here. He worked on security. She worked at the hospital a 1,000 hours. I'll be quick. I'll, I'll only use three minutes. <coughs> and over the years, I've watched this community grow. I spent my life and raised my children in Laguna Beach, my wife also. And <coughs> we've been here for a number of years. Uh, more importantly, uh, I was able to come in and experience this community as my mother lived to 104 years of age. And the things that <laughs> she faced in home care, limitations, restrictions, and that uh, were solvable. They didn't get solved. Um, we love the trees. She loved the trees. The trees have been so well maintained, so carefully and selectively pruned and carefully protected that all I can plead with you is be very careful that when you go outside to get to select the trees that need to be removed, that you select the right trees for the right reasons. Now, <coughs> the pine trees drop a lot of needles, needles, and a lot of people worry about that. But we don't take our feet, teeth out because we have to brush them. So bottom line is protect the trees, 
label them. If, if you can do that a little bit more, you've got a botanical garden here. A lot of people, more people would want to come in and visit, but then again, for families and relatives, it would be great for them to be able to walk around and see all these different species. Some of them aren't even grown anymore. Anyway, enough of that. You're doing a great job on this, uh, the landscape, and Kurt did a great job in presenting his problems. There are solutions, and Kikuya is a curse, so I'm, that's a separate subject. Last, I just say, uh, I'm observing the use of user fees as a way to expand budgets. And I would say, look at all your budgets very carefully before you expand the use of user fees and other uh, incidental methods of raising revenue. There are cost saving ways. I've worked with so many homeowners associations, set them up and plan communities. I know the problems. I respect what you're doing. Be careful as you go into the user fee area. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Due to modern technology, you did get a minute, a three and a half minutes. Thank you. <laughs> How nice. Maxine McIntosh, 68C. I hope someone will pass on to Kurt my congratulations on an excellent report. I've worked with Kurt for many years while both serving on GRF and United in landscape committee work, and I always found him to be knowledgeable, well-liked by the community, and thorough. So I appreciated his good report today. Uh, when I note all personal increases in costs recently passed are soon to become a, a reality from GRF and the homeowners associations in resolutions, I become concerned for all the village members who moved in some years ago, happy, believing they could afford to really enjoy every aspect of village life, which they chose to enjoy. Many bus, many bus riders, maybe I should say some because I don't have a number, but in riding the buses, I make a note of the ones who fall in this category, are often obviously in what I call the slow member stage of life. Slow, I'm sorry, slow memory. You know, at a doctor's conference last year, we were told that we probably all will reach slow memory someday. We try to think of something, we can't remember it, but we remember it 10 minutes later or that evening or maybe the next day. That is not a diseased brain, that's a slow brain. Diseased brain is a cognitive impairment like Alzheimer's where it's gone and can never be recovered. That's the big difference between the two. But a lot of people with slow memory are using the buses and it was so easy for them when all they had to do was flag down a bus. And then when they wanted to return to their manor, flag down a bus. Walk out at any time, if they didn't feel good one day, wait till the next day, wait till a later hour. It was so much easier for them. And I know with all good intentions, the new, re the new routing, the new schedule that is color coded and has numbers and so forth uh, is a wonderful effort and appeals to the younger riders. But I'm concerned that it's very difficult for the older riders to manage and particularly a call in situation where they have a list of information they must give over the phone. Um, but different things that are being passed like um, uh, increases in rental rates for uh, facilities here in GRF uh, seem very reasonable to most people and to me. But some of the rates are really jumping, not just GRF, but with the housing mutuals. And I wish somehow all you people uh, proposing these jumps could get together and see how it impacts one individual in each of your constituencies. I want to be sure everybody can still choose wisely from everything that's offered. I don't want them to want to get rid of our shared cost plan. That's such a strong aspect of our village. I want it always supported. Thank you. Good morning. I'm David Cohen from 592E, Avenida Mallorca. Uh, first, and I'm, I want to talk about the dog park for a second. First, I want to thank Mr. Hudson, who's been a wonderful conduit of information and support. I guess a priori, before I start off, I guess my question is what is going on? 12 days ago, uh, we came, uh, I came to a GRF uh, 
agenda setting meeting. Uh, I was under the impression that this was going to be an agenda item, and it's clearly an agenda item, but it's in a closed session. Uh, as a history, the dog park on Ridge Road, Ridge Road Drive, was closed very summarily by the city. And there were lots of issues that were brought up. Who owns title? Liability issues. Complainers. We have, right now, over 1,500 signees of the petition, and about 85% of them are in the village who signed this. We have 5,000 people in the village who own dogs. This dog park is being used by many people, many people with disabilities and abilities who cannot otherwise walk their dogs. We were told originally that there was an issue on title, and nobody seemed to know who owned the park. Well, the people involved from the community found out who owned the park. It's clearly GR GRF and Third Mutual. There was another issue about liability. Is there a liability associated with the park? We found out that according to Civil Code, California Civil Code 3342, there is no liability, that all liability in a dog facility throughout the state rests with the owner of the dog. And then we were told that there are complainers. And the complainers have a valid complaint. They have a right to complain. And we did a little research and found out that of the 216 units in Avenida Mariposa that are around the dog park, 30 of them were purchased before the dog park was open. So 86% of the individuals knew that the dog park was in existence when they purchased. Moreover, of those, of those there are approximately four that actually face the dog park, and there are three that are at the far end, which is now closed by the city. Our issue is that this park is going to be closed on October 18th. The city has sent an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, to GRF, and I assume Third Mutual. Uh, I've spoken to Chris Macon on a number of occasions. I've spoken to the mayor on a number of occasions. I guess what we would like to know, and to paraphrase what goes on in our administration, what the heaven is going on. Because we don't seem to, we seem to be following everybody and finding out information that people have said to us in the city and here that they don't know the answers to. So really, for the 1,500 signees of the petitions, and as I've mentioned at that GRF agenda setting meeting, if you gave us two weeks, we'd have five or 6,000 signees. And probably of that, we'd have 4,000 just from the village alone. Can you please give us some information as to what's going on or does the clock keep ticking louder and louder and louder until October 18th when that dog park is once again closed? And your clock just ticked. OK. <laughs> Without rehearsal. Uh, 389Q, Andre Torn. Uh, my question is about all the software imp implemented uh, and somehow relate to uh, uh, Kurt's mention about uh, Arbor help, uh, software help, her, help him out a lot. Uh, I don't know. Uh, my idea, I've been in computer business for all my career. Uh, the idea of putting a computer system, software system, is to reduce staff's workload, help them in making their job more efficient. And I'm not sure if uh, uh, what does that software improvement increase the workload or reduce the workload? If it increases the workload, then we have a problem here. You know, that may not be the right software. If we reduce the workload, then we should have more people on the field doing their job. So that should be uh, reflecting more the efficiency, more work, uh, more work accomplished. So I'm asking, I haven't seen anything like that. Shut up. Please silence your phone. <laughs> silence, silence. And so uh, what I would like to, uh, and I don't have any information on that. If we have improvement, then there should be something that telling us that yes, we re reduce the workload and we improve the efficiency here. Uh, so far, I haven't seen anything like that being anywhere. So is it possible that we produce anything like that to let the, uh, our residents know that because we spend so much money on the software, we've already improved our efficiency, improved our service. That's one thing. Second thing is more uh, specific. I was walking on the uh, creek area uh, south of here, uh, 
um, the, the uh, United uh, area. And there are cone pines this big, about the size of your head, okay? And it's more heavier than the uh, pineapples, bigger than the pineapples. And I'm not sure, uh, and they are laying, just laying on the ground, okay? So I'm not sure if, uh, why don't we have a sign or curd, you know, or lines blocking there and said, don't walk in there. Because if people walk by that area, got hit by a cone, uh, cone pine, by pine cone, that's going to be a major issue. Okay, so hopefully uh, we'll be taken care of that in that area. I'm not sure how many trees. I think it's, they call it a monkey, monkey pine tree or something like that. Okay, so hopefully that will, uh, issue will be resolved. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Judy and I'm at 3185C, Via Buena Vista. And thank you all for your service. Last name, please. Nussbaum, Nussbaum. I'm glad I don't have your jobs. I'm a very simple person. You should be. I really am, but I'm glad you're doing it and I appreciate everything you do. I moved here to Laguna Woods three years ago and one of the first things I heard here was that this was a compassionate community and how much I agree from helping my 97-year-old neighbors to everybody. It's a, a lot, well, there are a few grouches, but for the most part, it's a pretty good place. And I'm here to speak about the, um, the dog park issue. Uh, my husband and I moved in here with a couple little dogs, and just the other night, a coyote came down our street, and we see coyotes quite often where we live. And currently, I'm seeing a lot of carcasses. So I think the little coyotes that were born in spring are out there patrolling today in the mornings and the evenings. And so we prefer to take our little appetizers to a dog park where we feel safe. And it sounds to me like um, the, the property on Ridge Route has um, something has gone wrong. The city has taken care of it all this time. And it's been great. And then now we find out GRF owns it and Third Mutual owns it. And if we don't get 100% of the 200 people agreeing in Third Mutual to keep the dog park, we won't get the dog park. So you know what? I think we need to ask the committee here, GRF, Laguna Woods, where can we have a dog park? The community needs one. The seniors need one that can't walk their dogs. And we. It, it builds the community. To say that Laguna Woods and Laguna Woods Village has taken away the dog park, that's not compassionate. And that's, I would not move to a city that was not dog friendly. One of the reasons we came here is our real estate agent showed us the dog park. Shortly after moving in, we saw the coyotes. So I am here on behalf of the dog park. Whether it stay there, whether it be here or there, where we need a dog park in our community. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Anna Seifert. I live at 232A. I just wanted to bring to some people's attention here that on July 11th, either the evening of the 11th or the 12th, my 350Z was stole from my carport. I did not notice it till the next morning and I called security. Gentleman came out and took a report, so did the sheriff. I have never heard anything back from security. They don't seem to be the least bit curious who that person might be, more than likely a relative. He's only 30 years old, so he's probably a relative of someone in the village. And the fact that we have no cameras other than on gate fives or six to know, you know, anything. I just think that th we should take a more interest in our security and concerned, at least call me back. Do you know who the person was? But I was, you know, just really shocked that we move in here and we think we live in a very secure environment. And we really don't. I mean, no gated community is really secure, and I understand that. But that's just my biggest complaint, that nobody seemed to care. And my car was totaled on the 710 freeway four days later. So now I'm without a car totally as far as my fun car. And uh, I'm having to go to court proceedings, hopefully, to uh, keep this guy in jail for a real long time. So, And I did ask the DA to put on the report that he's not allowed to come in to Laguna Woods. 
Uh, but I do have his name, and if anybody's interested, they can ask me for it. Thank you. Oh, and I too support the dog park, although I don't use it for my dogs. I think it, we really need places with inside the village where we could, it, you know, because if people don't drive, they're not going to drive to the dog park. They, we need them spread out through in our village. I think that would be a great idea. Thank you all. Chris Collins, 3306Q. Um, good morning. I'm here to share um, some continuing efforts of the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village to assist residents who are in need. What do you do when there are only four ca cans of food left on the shelf, no milk in the refrigerator, and you have no money to buy more? <clears throat> the sad reality is that some village residents are simply outliving their money. But resources are available in Laguna Woods Village. Excuse me. <clears throat> First, the foundation is providing transportation to the South County Outreach Food Pantry on the second Tuesday of the month with the assistance of the Jewish Federation Silver Streak Program. All transportation costs are paid for by the foundation. The pantry permits qualified residents to get a, a week's worth of food once a month. When available, some residents can also get a senior box of non-perishable food. If transportation is needed to the food pantry, please contact social services at 949-597-4267. Please spread the word about available resources and make sure no resident goes hungry. Secondly, again this year, the foundation is partnering with the South County Outreach and Social Services to provide funding for Adopt a Senior for the Holidays program. Last year, a number of needy residents, pre-qualified by social services, participated in this program in which each recipient received a small gift as well as a holiday meal. Again, thank you so much for your generous, ongoing support for the foundation of Laguna Woods Village. Well, it would appear that member comments are you better get up here quickly, sir. <laughs> uh, Jim Roars, 2187P. I uh, left a couple of PowerPoint presentations over here this morning. Uh, I've just been curious if it would be reasonable to add a couple of car wash pads for the residents of the community to use. My car is dusty, not really dirty, and I hesitate to use just the driveways because this possibly possibly could be residues collect and uh, I'm just looking for a proposal. I'd be happy to be a, a focal on that if it's required for a committee. Thank you. All right. Member comments appear to be over so now, are there director responses to member comments? I pushed the button oh. on my list. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let's. We got this technology in front of us, so <laughs> hit your buttons, folks. Okay, Tom's number one. Okay. You, know, you just have to tap it to keep it. It goes to sleep. Tap the screen. <laughs> okay, you're on there, Ray. But third, no, no. Number one was Tom. So go, Tom. Um, I have one response to Anna about the stolen car issue. Um, there's a sergeant in the back room there. I bet if you contact him, uh, he'll discuss the situation and what normally happens. This is a win. Your car got stolen. We brought the sheriff in. He found out who it is. He's arrested and you're going to court. That's a win. Should security contact you and make sure you're okay afterwards? Probably so. But sometimes, that's overlooked, but I'm sure that our security professionals will be more than happy to try to make you happy during this unfortunate situation. Thank you very much. All right, Judith. Yeah, I'd like to address uh, Tony, David, and Judy, and everybody else who's concerned about the dog park. It happens that on our closed agenda this afternoon, we do have a legal issue for the dog park. So we are all um, very concerned about our canine residents 
and we will be addressing that with very uh, open hearts and concern. Thank you. Okay, my speakers disappeared, but I know, Ray, you were on there. Go ahead. Okay, uh, answer to Tony. Uh, Tony, you said, uh, why can't, I believe, why can't our security people uh, do the job of the police department? First off, they're not police officers. They're not, uh, they cannot do the job. We must mandate calling in a sheriff's department on a criminal matter. So that, that's one of the answers, Tony. We have no choice. We can't do it. <clears throat> okay, I don't see any other director comments. Oh, Beth, I'm sorry. <laughs> John, press your button. Beth, you're oh, next. Oh, I'm on now. Okay. I would like to um, address David and Judy and say thank you very much for the clarity of expressing the view of the dog park users. In making any kind of a decision, which we will be talking about making a decision this afternoon about perhaps making some decision, it's good to have a full view of the whole situation on, on all sides. And thank you so much for that the information that you shared with us. Um, and then I'd like to say thank you to Chris for coming and talking about options for our seniors within the community. And those are the folks that Maxine was talking about, folks that are worried about outliving their income and folks who are struggling with emergencies. And please know that our our transportation department is working on trying to meet needs of all of our citizens and our social services in connection with the foundation is truly working to try to meet some of the emergency needs of folks in our community. Thank you. You're not on my screen. Now you are, but before you is Brad. <laughs> Thank you. I, I just wanted to comment on a couple things. Uh, first of all, um, with respect to the stolen car and security, um, obviously, if if that would have been in the five six area, we'd have had much better information, and and may have actually prevented the person from entering the village. So, uh, I know the highest priority of the boards for next year is the new gate arms. And I'll just for those who haven't heard, I've said it many times. A one, two, three, four, we'll get the gate arms next year, as well as uh, seven, eight, nine, and 14. So those eight are scheduled for next year, and the year after will be 12 and, and probably a 10, 11 combo if we can make that work. So that's, that's what's uh, before us right now, and, and we look forward to, to bringing that enhanced uh, security uh, to our residents. Uh, I, Maxine, with respect to uh, transit service, I mean, I, obviously our transit environment has changed a lot over, over the last five or 10 years. From having 500,000 riders a year, we'll have less than 200,000 this year. So I don't know what business loses 60% of their customers and, and doesn't change the way they're approaching their business. They probably wouldn't be in business too much longer. And so we're looking at, at very different ways of doing that, that that not only are much more f efficient and environmentally friendly, but also provide a lot better service to the customer. So hopefully they'll want to do it again and again and again. So that really dictates more of a demand response sort of environment, which, which we are uh, kind of leaning towards. We're not there yet, but we're, we're very close to be able to provide that kind of service. And in fact, I asked Chuck, but he didn't respond. He actually has an app for that, a Laguna Woods Village. It's almost an Uber-like app. And so we'll be rolling that out on a, on a very trial basis, uh, probably beginning of next year, and, and having residents give that a try. But it was a very, very exciting time 
uh, to be in the village. And then lastly, on the giant pine cone, I can't remember that type of tree. It's Ericaria uh, heterophylla, and it's from Chile. And the, the fruit on it, it's fruit, it's not a cone, is about yay tall, and it does weigh. I mean, if you got hit by it, you'd be out. We, we had one of those in a, in a city park, and I know uh, certain times of the year we would uh, put a little sign up there, you know, stay away from three or watch from falling fruit, and that we probably need to, to think about that if it's in an accessible area. Well, we had it in the horticulture department at Orange Coast College. We had one, and we put up yellow tape when we knew the uh, fruit was... Um, and there, there are, I think, two or three in the creek area, but they're... They're not on the pathway. They're, you'd have to, but it's probably a good idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to landscape about uh, making that a little safer down there. That fruit is huge. Okay, I have Catherine on my screen. Yeah, I'd like Catherine to. Catherine is before Director Beckett. Okay. I would just like to respond to Andre. <clears throat> Andre, you've been, because you're on uh, United's board. I think you, you know what the budget situation is. And I'd just like to remind you, if you take a look at the budgets, since we've made the transition, okay, we were looking at back in 2014, 2015, of budgets for this community of close to $108 million. This year, our budget is going to be less than $100 million. I'm guessing right around $98 million. And GRF itself the budget is $2 million less than it was in 2014 and 2015. So progress has been made. The implementation of the software is in fact the thing that is helping us. Um, and my opinion is Brad has been driving, uh, you know, with, with Chuck, looking for the means to be more effective in our communication to be more effective in the scheduling of our people and to be more effective in offering the services to, uh, to our residents. And I haven't been over across the hall recently, but from what I hear, the lines have nearly disappeared. And I know the goals are to make sure if somebody calls in, they get a response within 24 hours. Those of us who've lived here for 20 some years, know the difference and can see the difference. People who've recently moved in don't know what has gone on before, but all I can say is, in my opinion, the action that was taken several years ago, a couple years ago now, we're beginning to see financially the benefit from it. And although there's complaints on landscaping, I think we've got a pretty good presentation of what all the issues have been in that area. And so we're dealing with the issues as they come forward. And, uh, and I think that, Andre, you, you know, uh, I wouldn't be too concerned that we're not benefiting from the implementation of the software. Thank you. Director Beckett. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to uh, respond to uh, what David Cohen said. I attended the uh, city hall meeting when the dog park came up, and uh, I saw a lot of people stand up and talk about what they wanted and what their concerns were. And I, and Mr. Cohen, uh, I, he came to our last agenda prep meeting and he sat there the whole time. And for those of you who support the dog park or, or who have a dog, I think uh, I have to point out that Mr. Cohen is putting in a lot of work on this. For example, uh, It's not easy to get petitions signed, especially to get 1,500 signatures. And a lot of times uh, you'll run into problems from a council. They'll, tell, they'll say, well, there's a liability issue here. Well, Mr. Cohen did his homework. He went up and found a civil code section that says that uh, owners of the dog park are exempt from liability. And uh, he went and he found out all about uh, the units that face the dog park. And this is the kind of activism that gets things done. And it's a lot of hard work. And uh, it would be nice for us, when we make our decision, if you could write us a memo 
setting forth what you've learned and, and uh, what your members want and uh, telling us about the, uh, what you found out. And um, from what I've heard so far, I, I think uh, there's a lot of support here for that dog park. Thank you. All right. Um, as far as the dog park goes, we had it as an open agenda item in today's session and under advice of counsel, because some issues came up, we were advised that we should deal with it in closed session. So we're not trying to change horses in midstream. You know, we inherited the dog park about the same time that the city decided that they were gonna close it. So this is not an issue that we've been dealing with for very long. This has never been within our jurisdiction. It's never been in our area of responsibility. So we're as new to this problem as you are, and, um, and the facts change on a daily basis. So, um, you know, my, my personal feeling is the city will keep the dog park open until the thing is, is ultimately resolved. But otherwise, they're going to have all of you down there every time they open the door. So um, that seems the obvious thing, that until there's an ultimate solution, it'll stay open like it's been open for the number of years that it's already been open. Uh, Ernie Reynolds, why aren't you on a board or a committee? Um, and I am well aware of your past. I'm well aware of the firm that did most of the landscape architecture, Lent and Forsum, who used to employ half the Cal Poly landscape, Depart landscape architecture department students. Um, and as far as labeling the trees, Kurt Ron mentioned the Arbor Pro program. And actually, there will be a public um, access to the Arbor Pro program as soon as we get a little further along on the website, and you'll be able to put in information as to a location, and Arbor Pro will tell you what that tree is. And so um, it's almost like we won't need signs because you'll have a photograph and a location for that p particular species. And Arbor Pro has placed a value on our urban forest in this community in excess of $100 million. Um, and th this company who does um, surveys of uh, various communities, including the city of San Francisco, valued our trees at a higher value than the trees in the city of San Francisco. And that's based on care, you know, level of health, et cetera. So, you know, it is, it is a respected amenity and it's a respected resource that, that is being dealt with on a professional manner. Um, the gentleman regarding the car wash, um, we, it will have to go to the correct committee and we'll just continue to see, you know, how that evolves. But I'll tell you this, the wheels of progress turn slowly in the woods. So it's not going to happen tomorrow. And um, I, Tony Dower, I think you've left the room already. But um, there is a meeting tomorrow afternoon in this room that will be a report from the architects who were hired, not analysts, they're architects, were hired for the design of the Performing Arts Center. And they will be giving their first report back to the ad hoc committee. And, that, and that's an open meeting. Anybody can attend. And uh, this is after they have met with every user group that uses the Performing Arts Center, including the billiards people. So this is a uh, collaborative process. And input is being sought from various groups. Um, and that concludes my, that concludes the director's comments. The next item on the agenda, I think, is the consent calendar, of which there's none, which brings us to item 13B, which we have moved. And Judith will read the um, motion. 
Resolution 90-17-XX, whereas Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods has administrative control of recreational vehicles, RV lots A and B, which spaces are rented to residents. And whereas the current rate of $160 a year was established on January 1, 2007, and does not cover the cost of service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that November 7, 2017, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby increases the RV lot fee from $160 per space to $400 per space per year, effective January 1, 2018, and resolve further that the single flat fee shall be charged to users of all recreational vehicles, trailers, boats, and trailer combinations or units, regardless of overhaul length, and that the fee be included in the monetary fee schedule. And resolve further that resolution 90-06-95, adopted November 7, 2006, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. Uh, before I move for this resolution, I'd like to uh, mention that, that the staff recommends that the board postpones the resolution to the next available board meeting no less than 30 days from the postponement to comply with Civil Code 4360. Since it's only 24 days to our October meeting, we had to move it to the November meeting, which is November 7th. I move, just to place it on the floor for discussion, uh, that we pass this resolution. I second it. All right, the resolution was moved by Judith Troutman and seconded by Joan Millman. Discussion, Tom Circle. Uh, yeah, Mr. President, based upon input from staff, an input that uh, many of us have received from the community. Um, I'd like to amend the amount, the fee of 400 down to 320 uh, and amend this resolution and the fee come, come down to 320. All right, an amended motion to reduce the annual fee from 400 to 320 was moved by Tom Circle and seconded by Joan Millman. Discussion. Okay, I have, press your buttons, folks. <laughs> no, 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 we're not voting, this is to speak. <laughs> and the way it works, and you know this, is we talk first and then you talk. Okay, Tom, you're on my list as first. Okay, uh, Catherine. Uh, yes, I, I have basically a, a question. I, I know that because the, the change uh, up to 400 was that which was brought forward by committees. And my question is, um, Brad, do, if we go at 320, how to, is that what we assumed in our budget, or what, what is the budget based on? I think the budget is based on 300. 300. So if we were at 320, then the budget that we're going to be passing today then um, is still valid. Yes. We don't, we don't have any issues there. So relative to that, I personally do not have any opposition then to having the uh, per space charge go to 320 from 400 and would be supportive of the amendment. All right, Richard Palmer. I like to talk about the uh, cost. Uh, the $400, I was at that committee meeting and I thought the $400 was arbitrarily selected and there was no reason to up, up the fee that much. I was shocked that they did that, but that's what happened. I went down to the park and looked at it, and I thought, uh, one thing, the landscaping was very minimal. Uh, there was two dump stations. One had a permanent, almost a permanent uh, trailer, uh, RV s s sitting there, and a l woman who uh, has an RV stated that uh, it was there for some time. So 
I can, I can understand why the sewage rates are so high and even the water rates. I mean, there was nothing there. And the other thing is, uh, I know uh, staff is addressing this, but there are a lot of vehicles there that shouldn't be there. So I, I, I think it's really unfair to dump uh, <laughs> this total cost on people that are, uh, that are using this as an RV lot. And I hope, uh, I'm, I, I would like to see it lower than 300, but uh, I would settle for the 320. All right. Thank Ray, you. Ray Gross. Uh, <clears throat> just an aside, <clears throat> I have no objection to the 320. I had done a little calculation on it. I called Irvine Storage, and for a 28-foot motorhome, it's $155 a month. For a 40-foot motorhome, it's $185 a month. I had calculated at $350, indicating it would be like $29.16 a month, or like $9, you know, 91 cents a day. So it's not that we're going crazy on this thing. I, I, I think, like I said before, when I lived in Prescott, Arizona in 1990s, I paid $350 a year. That was in the 90s. So 320 certainly is not out of the question. Director Beckett. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as Director Gross pointed out, the charges that the, our members are paying to store their RVs are much cheaper than uh, the going rate. However, just about all of our user fees around here are a bargain, and we don't always base them on what the market rate is. For example, the golfers, they pay only a fraction of what uh, they would have to pay at another golf course. So uh, <coughs> when, we, uh, when we take <coughs> into account the market value of a particular amenity or uh, something that's offered to our members, we really have to, t to remember that the rest of us are also being subsidized. When uh, I, I get to play ping pong, and uh, that uh, comes out of our, user, our, our monthly assessments. And uh, when you get to rent a clubhouse, why, almost free. So uh, I think that uh, the, the idea that we're not, our members aren't really paying their, their fair share is, if you compare it to the market, that may be true, but if you compare it to what the other members are getting, well, it's, it's, it's fair. If you uh, look at it at, uh, you know, uh, $160, sure, that's a, that's a bargain if you go out to get it somewhere else, but if you compare it to what the other uh, users of the other facilities are getting, they're also getting a bargain, too. So I think that uh, we're going to have to look at this whole shared cost concept and figure out how much of it we want to base on market value and how much of it do we really want to subsidize. And uh, I'm in, I'm, I support this uh, reduction to $300, but before we vote on 320. this, to 320, before we vote on this, I'd like to hear from the members and see what they have to say about it. Thank you. We will. All right, um, Diane Phelps. In answer to the question of what's included in the budget, it was double last year. So last year was 160, so they just doubled the amount, and that's where, the, so 320 is what's budgeted. Um, as to, uh, let's see, which, as a fair market value of, an as, of a service, we really don't use that very often. I mean, I think in the exception rate, maybe we do for some of the clubhouse rooms or something, but we're, what we're really looking at in this case is, the, is how much it's costing us um, for this amenity. And um, so it's what we've been given from staff, and, and, and this isn't something that was just, com it was only compiled by the, by the finance ser financial services division. We actually, uh, there was input from each of the department heads, and they came up with direct costs of $125,000, and that divided by 415 spaces um, was where the $300 comes from. Um, it was estimated that overhead was about $50, um, like an educated uh, figure, guess, I guess. But in any case, um, 
and 50 times 400 spaces is about $20,000. So where does that come from? Well, the, the 300 per, or $125,000, which is the 300 per, per space, um, doesn't include depreciation. It's cost that, um, like depreciation is about $11,000. So just to try to give you an idea what these costs are. So myself, I, I support um, the, I would speak in favor of the 320. I think it's a, a much more realistic figure, um, either 320 or 350, than, certainly than 400. Um, and let's see, what was the other thing? Uh, I'll think of it later. <laughs> I know. I was going to talk about exclusive use. Oh, so, that's the, where I was going. so what's different about this lot mm -hmm. is that it is ex there is excuse exclusive use for the people mm -hmm. that have the lot that that have a space. So you have say. an RV, you have a space. I can't bring my RV and park it in your space, mm -hmm. right? You have it 24/7, 365 days a year. Why that is different than any other amenity? most other amenities, is if I go to golf, I can't golf every day, all day. I can, I sign up for a, a tee time. I can go over to the tennis courts and play. I can uh, shoot billiards. Um, I can do a lot of different things, but when it's, this is what we call exclusive use, and to my knowledge, there are only four uh, amenities in which there's exclusive use. One of them, we have some lockers. Mm -hmm. I believe they're in golf and, and maybe in Clubhouse 4. Those are the only ones I know about. Um, so Clubhouse 2. In Clubhouse 2. Um, there is the RV lot. There's also um, the garden center. Did I say 4? Uh, there's also the garden center. And, the, um, and those are the only things where we have it. Oh, in the, uh, I guess I didn't mention the equestrian center. So those are the only four amenities that we have that are exclusive use. Um, and so that is why we're treating the RV lot separate from all, uh, most of the other amenities. Um, okay, there we go. I'll be done. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next person on my list is Catherine. Yeah, I forgot. I forgot to mention one of the things. I did some research a little bit to find out if there's some other uh, homeowners associations that offer, that have RV parking, and did find one in Huntington Beach, Landmark, and there they charge $30 a month for those who park their RV uh, in a lot that they have available, which comes out to be $360 a year. So. If you want to say, do we look at it? We're not comparing to outside agencies. In this case, we're looking at similar situations. Landmark has over a thousand units, so it's a fairly large uh, association, and that's what they charge. I don't know of any others in the, in the county that offers this um, this amenity. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to speak in favor of this motion. And I also would like to state that my sister has an RV in the lot, and this is her second RV in the lot. She's been a longtime RV lot user. Um, and just like the garden center, the uh, attention to take a good look at the RV uh, lot came about because there was a constant chatter within the community of the abuse that was going on in the facility. The garden center abuse was like unreal. And there's also been significant abuse in the RV center. And one of the reasons to increase the revenue source in the RV center is to improve the management. And it takes time to find out who's neglected RV, so-called RV, is sitting there being used as a storage unit because it's cheaper to use a, an old vehicle to store all your junk in than it is to go to a storage place. So I don't think there's anyone sitting out here that is unaware that this facility has had abuse. And if, if you sit on a board we have had a significant increase in compliance issues in the RV lot. And that has taken, it takes time from security to write up the violations, to look into it, 
It takes board time to deal, not that we are compensated, um, it takes board time to deal with this. And so I think what we're looking at, just like we did the garden center, we want to make it a quality facility. RV people have been in here complaining the gate wasn't locked, this and that. Well, you're going to have better management and better control and a better facility if we have a little bit more to work with. And there's not a person sitting in this room that doesn't know that $320 is a deal. $160 was an incredible deal. So I'm going to shut up, and it's now member comments on this issue. You got it? Okay. Uh, I guess initially, thank you very much for the reduction to something that is more reasonable, even if it is more than is needed. I am looking at the cost summary as provided, and I noticed that asphalt seal is listed as a six year amortization. I believe the last time the lot was sealed was either 10 or 12 years ago. We're not on a six year. We're on a 10 or 12 year, which means that that $51,000 that you're saying it costs to slurry coat the lot is really down to about $42.50. I question custodial services. $19,900. If any of you take the time to go to Lot A and look at the bathroom, it's about this wide and about this deep. There is a custodian that comes in once a week. I believe he's there for about 15 minutes, is my observation. And $19,900 for custodial services seems quite excessive to me. I just think even doubling the cost is way more than is necessary. Anybody, Ray, who compares this to the outside, I don't believe you're supposed to be making a profit off the residents. Anybody on the outside is making a profit. And I urge you to go down and look at Seal Beach. Seal Beach has a lot, cost zero. Thank you. Maxine McIntosh, 68C. By the way, about how many RV spaces are we talking about? 415. 450 spaces available. 15. Oh, 15. Thanks. OK. Uh, you know, uh, we boards in the past were negligent. The rates should have been increased. I'm not against the increase. They should have been increased gradually over a number of years. And they weren't. And when you look at the letters in here in our agenda, 13B, what are there, seven, eight, I think eight, nine letters here? And you read them, and some of them point out the very thing I'm very concerned about, is people who have budgeted carefully to enjoy perhaps a small RV. And they, find, they would find this increase all at once, really a, a task for them to cover. But I proposed, you're talking about a 200 about a 200% increase would be an increase per year for four years of $80. <coughs> you add $80 in four years, we've got the 320. And then it might be time to look at a continued increase for a while. But $80 a year would be such a kinder move for a lot of these people. I, I see in this one letter, number eight, would you kindly consider 
a modest increase on an annual basis rather than hitting us all at once. On a side note, many of us have golf carts that we depend on for transporting, gas tax, and so forth. But they're, they're asking, many of them, I, I didn't really notice any of them saying, please don't increase it at all. They're saying, make it gradual, make it modest. So I hope you will consider that. You can have the sum total, but why not? Why not spread it out over four years? Good afternoon. I think it's afternoon. Yep. Almost. Anyway, um, I'm Marty Reese, 486 Alpha. Um, I've spoke to you last time when you had your meeting, and I think I submitted a letter to some of you. Your emails went through. Um, my concerns are, I, I agree, I am in agreement that, a, that an increase probably should be due. After talking and hearing and reading everything that's gone on, I think we are getting a good deal here. I think it's reasonable. I also think that comparing it with outside rates um, seems unfair because we are in a community. We, I believe that we are the one amenity here that isn't subsidized. You can mention golf lockers, but they're part of the golf fees. Um, you can mention the equestrian center. It gets 50% shared costs. So you can mention the gardens. They're still part of the group things. So we are the one amenity that does, gets no other shared costs. So we are paying for the RV lots, only us. And now that I understand from Chief Moy, it looks like only lot A is going to be used for RVs. So only lot A is going to have, I think it's 337 RVs. Lot B is going to be used for trailers and boats and commercial vehicles. So lot B is the one over by security, and it is going to cut out. Not, so we're not going to have 415 RVs, from what I'm understanding. I got a map, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I got a map from them, and they're going to have lot A as only RV vehicles, and they're going to put the other ones in lot B. That's what I was told yesterday. And so I got this, and I can see where all the lots are going to be, and it's going to be for lot. So that comes down to a lot less RVs that are going to be able to be there. And now that we're taking on commercial vehicles, I did not mention, I did not hear them mentioned in your resolutions. Now, maybe I didn't hear that, but I didn't hear commercial vehicles. There's no board decision on that man. Uh-huh. Okay. But I didn't hear it, so that's so great. So what you heard from security is not a board decision. Great. Um, well, I did, they didn't meant, they just know that they're not taking, they're leaving them in right now. I hope you're not leaving them in, but that's my personal opinion and my legal opinion, because I don't think you should be taking them in. Um, but you're going to have 337 RVs in Lot A, according to this map, and there won't be any in Lot B. And I also hope that once you get the list established, there shouldn't have ever been a waiting list. If, you, if security, if the work had been done properly over the last few years, I know there was an old management, and now there's new management. So there's, I don't know where the blame is or what the problems were or where the breakdown was. It's not my job to judge. But if the job had been done, there wouldn't be a waiting list for RVs. I'm on a waiting list. OK, I have to be on a waiting list. There shouldn't be a waiting Your list. Your time has expired. OK, but there shouldn't be a waiting list. There shouldn't be commercial vehicles. You're repeating yourself. Thank you very much. I'm good at that. <laughs> Gary Morrison, 107R. Um, my reply to this is, and, and I've had complaints from different people, different residents who say, why should I be paying for 400 people using an RV lot? It really is not a shared cost. And therefore, the actual expenses should be picked up by the user. And the fact that someone has an RV, to me, is a luxury. I don't have one, can't afford one. So why should I have to pay for someone that thinks they should have one? Uh, 
Andre Torn, 389. Uh, could you reset the time? Okay, thank you. Andre Torn, 389Q. Uh, I'm an RVer, so I'm looking at this issue. Uh, uh, and I, I've talked to a lot of people, and I think I know some answers for your concerns. First, abused. Um, there is a misconception that if we raise the price, we will drive out abused people. It never works. Raise the price will annoy all the re uh, residents. It will not drive out the uh, abusers. Okay, let's forget about raising costs to drive out abusers. Second thing is about exclusive use. Uh, if you look at Go to Clubhouse 4, there are a lot of exclusive uses. All the rooms, they don't not, not just having space, but they also have roofs, they have walls, they have facilities. And they have equipment staying there overnight, 24 by 7, 365 days a year. So we have, RV is staying there, and we come, sometimes we go out, we come back in, we go out and come back in. At least we are moving that. But if you look at Clubhouse 4, those equipment are not moving. They stay there. Although nobody's using them, it's not that the residents don't want to use them. It's because they are locked. OK, so hopefully we can have the uh, understanding that that's the way the share cost works. OK. And also, uh, the equipment that we have in there, uh, we have uh, uh, tennis abusers. We talked about that a lot in the past. Do we raise the price to reduce the abusers? No, we put in security. OK, so that's the way, the right thing to do is to put in the security, put in the management approach to resolve these issues rather than raise the price. We don't raise the tennis uh, uh, price, okay? Tennis uh, club price, okay? And also, to solve the waiting list problem, we use this, uh, the same approach many times in different uh, occasions. We create a pickleball court, spend money on that to solve their uh, uh, crowded issue. We spend money on the long bowling to solve the crowded issue. We spend money on the uh, bocce ball. We spend money on those things to resolve the waiting list, to resolve the crowded issue. So why don't we spend money on the uh, uh, RV lot, increase the RV lot space to reduce the waiting list problem? Now, if we just keep on waiting list, we don't we say we don't want to waste money. Maybe we should be rewarded rather than punished by raising price. Thank you very much. Ernie Reynolds, 28C <coughs> Avenue, Castilla. Uh, last thing I comment I made was uh, beware of user fees. User fees are, uh, are uh, addictive. If we were doubling the golf fee, issuing, is, issuing $2 or a dollar a token for a bus ride and everybody had to pay and use it. The user gets to pay for that. Um, the issue of the um, bridge club, uh, the building and how that evolved, that's a key one. There's exclusive use. Uh, the RV park does not get the eleven, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 a month maintenance that is in this new budget. Now, Mike was very clear about our token restroom facility. We could upgrade that. We could even have a proper toilet. We could have the right signs on the door. We could have it so that it worked properly. There's a lot of things that needed. And extra security is not necessarily the first need. So if there is, in your wisdom, an increase in fees, my plea to you is upgrade the facilities to something approaching the kind of level that you envision for this community. Because this community is really going to a resort community focused on Laguna Beach and its proximity and a few other benefits. Thank you.
one positive. Mike Landry, 693B. One positive about, uh, I'm, my, my RV is in, on Campo Verde. I think that's B, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, thank you for the upgrade of the bathroom there. It's really quite nice. Uh, but the, uh, the, the negative is that the dump station never works and has not worked for about a year. Every time I go there, uh, it, it overflows. It's not any fun because um, I don't want my own nasty stuff coming back up or is any, any more than I want anybody else's. So a negative and a positive. Thank you for the bathroom. Uh, thank you for the slurrying that's going to happen. It's just I'm going to have a problem getting my trailer in and out. I think you know about that. Thank you much. Judith. Um, I'll address several people. First, Andre talks about increased security over there and policing and fixing the problems, getting rid of the, All that takes money to order extra security and to add staff time to police all of the um, abusers and things of that nature. Uh, if I want to go play cards, I don't have to get on a waiting list. I can just walk over to Clubhouse 7 and say, I want to play in this game and, and, and join a game. Uh, I can't do that with the RV lot. First, you have to own an RV just to even get on the waiting list. So that puts me out of the game right there. Because if I do buy an RV, I'm going to have to go pay $400 a month to store it someplace else while I'm on the list. So I was going to say everything that Diane said, and she said it uh, beautifully. You also forget one thing that's not on this list. We pay taxes on that property. And that's not even on this list. Oh, very little, it's, yeah, but there's still things like that. And it's prime property, prime location property. And there's a lot of things people on this side of the dais are being hit with that we could use that property for other really valuable functions uh, that would benefit this community even more than an RV lot. So the fact that you still have the land, I think, um, is a blessing in disguise right there. So um, the $20, as far as Max, what Maxine said, OK, so if our costs are going to be $300 so we can fix all these things that you complain about, then the extra $20, I think, if we were to, let's say, OK, for the next five years, we're going to increase it so much a month, that might not take up a lot of director's time, but it's still going to take up staff time and administrative time to have to do that every year, to increase it every year, rather than to just do it now and get it over with and not do it again for 10 years. So you have to look at all those costs that aren't even in this list that you guys don't even think about. And so that's why I'm going to vote in favor of the 320. I think that's fair. I thought 400 was way too high anyway in the beginning. But um, I will go with the 320 because there's a lot of things that you guys don't see that we see on this side of the dais. Thank you. Diane. Um, I was just going to say that to Maxine's $80, every year, we're only raising the fee 100%. And so, I mean, I say, as opposed to your 200%. So it would need to be increased $80 in 2018 and $80 in 2019. You wouldn't have to do it $80 increase for four years. Um, and the other thing, respect respectively to Andre, is that I do not think it's like Clubhouse 4, um, except for the lo if there are lockers in Clubhouse 4. And the other is that if you look at the guidelines for our shared cost fees, shared costs and fees, this the, there are, are, four, are a few exceptions listed, an exclusive use of a facility by, by a small number of residents is one of the exceptions. We are within our policy of shared guy of shared costs. All right, ma'am, I'm going to let you be the last speaker on this issue because we have a huge agenda that this is the first item, so we cannot spend the entire day on this issue. So please. I will be very brief. My name is D Winterstrom 40023G. I've been here 18 years. Uh, most of that time I've had an RV. Um, my biggest question is, based on the 2006 analysis that was, uh, the uh, cost analysis that was done in 2006, just one item here, they grouped the utilities together in 2006 and indicated they were approximately $5,800. For 2018, 
they are $41,000. How did that happen? How so, does that happen? Southern Cal California Edison has raised their prices outrageously. Really? 41000 Okay. And then they talk about other costs based from 10 years ago to now increasing, but very little for security. It's hardly even one person, even if he was there 40 hours a week, which we know he's not. Your uh, endorsement on page one of one for agenda item 13B refers to an evaluation, a fee evaluation that was done in 2009. We've never seen that. That's never been presented to us. And I'm a hoarder when it comes to collecting stuff and keeping it on the RV lot for the, at the boards and committees have done. We've never seen that. So I don't know where that came from at all. Um, I also like you to consider that maybe if you base it on a square footage, like you do the garden centers, the same size square footage for the average RV space is 200 square feet. And in the uh, garden center, 200 to 400 square feet is $93 a year. I know they don't, I know they use more water than we do. They have to use more water than we do. They don't have a sewer. I don't think they have a bathroom. I doubt of secure, oh, do they have a bathroom? Great. They don't, I don't know how often security drives through there, but over the past three years, security has hardly ever driven through our RV lots. That's why we had so much crime and things stolen. There are not people living in their RVs there, which was one thing that someone brought up at one time. I think um, this increase that you're proposing is preposterous, but it's certainly a lot better than the $400. Thank you. Richard. I'd like to ask Brad a question about security at the RV lot. What are they gonna put in a, uh, a card reader rather than a key lock? At lot B? Yes. Yeah, no, that's in the works right now. Uh, Chuck's reviewing that. Um, as you see, we're going, well, everywhere in the village pretty much, and putting uh, those card readers in primarily to stop unauthorized uh, guests and uh, occupants uh, from utilizing the facilities. Uh, that that uh, unfettered access makes us kind of attractive to those who prefer not to follow the rules. So uh, this is just another area where we'll be stepping up and doing that. Thank you. I know a, lo a lot of discussion is focused around what's been done in the past, and I, I would ask folks, uh, or I'd tell them that that's really irrelevant because we're doing something now. We're going to fix both these bathrooms, the dump stations. We're going to slurry these lots, provide great security, more cameras. It's just a different ball game. And uh, uh, so you need to look forward. And hopefully, a lot of these things will be concluded before the beginning of the year. So, so when you do start paying these fees, you're realizing the benefits of a vastly improved facility. Lucy. Brad, you did say cameras. He did. Yes. Yeah, cameras, I think, are important here. Yeah. That's what I was going to suggest. All right. Um, can we just vote? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to restate the motion. We have an amended motion, which the amendment, which we did not vote on. So, first, we need to vote on the amended motion, and then. <laughs> The amendment is to reduce the annual fee from 400 to 320. So I'm now asking you to commence voting for the amended motion. The amendment. The amendment to the motion. Got screens? We're working on it. We don't do, we don't, okay, so we can, we'll do it by hand. We're gonna, because they can't do two on yet. <laughs> They'll get it. <laughs> all right, all those in favor of the amendment to lower the fee from 400 to 320, please raise your hand. Okay, opposed? All right, it's unanimous. All right, now we're gonna use our fancy little screen
and we're going to vote on the resolution, which now reads 320. So we're voting on the resolution for the annual fee of 320. So screen. All right, commence voting, cease voting. All right, so the motion carries eight. All right. Well, Joanne's not here. And okay. So was there an opposition to that? Did anybody? So then it's got to be. Nine, and I didn't vote. All right, all right. The resolution passes. So that takes place January first. Twelve a. Okay. Okay, we're going to go to twelve a, but we'll wait until they clear. Okay, we're going to hit uh, 12A, which is to entertain a motion to approve and increase the initial occupant fee, changing the basis from 25% to a flat fee of 90 per month from 47, effective January 1st, 2018. And this is to satisfy the 30-day thing. So... Do we have to read the resolution or can we suspend the reading of the resolution? You can always suspend the reading. Okay, but I need one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, we've got six. Okay. So can I hear a motion to suspend the res reading of the resolution? Okay. I second. It was moved by Ray Gross and seconded by Judith Troutman to suspend the reading of the resolution. All right. All those in favor of suspending the reading of the resolution? Raise your hand. All right. So moved. So this just goes its merry way, right? Well, now we vote on it. No, we don't. Oh, this is the 30 days. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well, but we did this before, so this is the, yeah. is the 30 day been satisfied? We just voted to no. not read it. We still have to vote on it. Yeah. All right. Three. It has okay. been satisfied. Okay, so all those, do I have a motion to approve this resolution? I move to approve right. resolution 90-17. Okay, it's been moved by Judith and seconded by Ray Gross to approve the resolution. All those, any discussion? <laughs> I saw you coming. <laughs> Mary Stone, 356C. Once again, I would like to say there are a number of people who are bedridden, who have caretakers and all, and family members who are the caretakers, not, not uh, outsiders who are caretakers. And I think that, uh, that, there need, that you need to consider accepting waivers for those who absolutely do not use the GRF facilities. And it's usually two people out of the three who do not use the facilities. And I think that needs to be considered. No, too complicated. All right, there's no further discussion. All those in favor of this resolution, please hit your magic button. All 
All right, have you commenced your voting? Have you ceased your voting? All right, cease voting. All right, the motion carries, uh, motion carries. And my comment to Mary is that if this becomes a problem, you can always deal with it when it becomes a problem. All right, we are now on 12B, which is to entertain a motion to approve a resolution to suspend cable internet in the event of disciplinary action. And Judith? Resolution 90-17. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation is an association formed to manage a common interest development under the Davis Sterling Common Interest Development Act, Articles of Incorporation, and Article 9, or 11. Whereas the purpose of the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation is to develop and to maintain facilities and services, bylaw 2.1.1, to operate community facilities, bylaw 2.1.2, and to operate as a common interest development in accordance with the Davis-Sterling Common Interest Development Act in providing community facilities, bylaw 2.1.3. And whereas the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation has the power to adopt rules and regulations, including disciplinary procedures with regard to its mutual members and permitted and approved qualifying residents, co-occupants, tenants, and their guests, bylaw 2.2.3 and the authority to establish policy, bylaw 2.3. Can and, I interrupt you yeah. at this point? Yes. And, and the next okay. whereas says cable television services, but I think it should say cable slash internet, just as it does at the top of the resolution. And should that appear again anywhere it says that, it should be cable slash internet, okay? No, it's a this is what we're dealing with, Juanita. It's the whole purpose of the resolution. Okay, now you can. Sorry to interrupt. Take out the word television. Yeah. yeah. Okay, whereas cable slash internet services for the mutual members, qualifying residents, co occupants, tenants, and their guests are provided by way of a contract between the Golden Rain. Foundation Corporation and a cable provider called Master Contract, and then a bulk service contract between the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation and the Housing Mutuals, which consists of Laguna Woods Mutual Number 50, Third Laguna Hills Mutual, and United Laguna Woods Mutual. And whereas each of the Housing Mutuals bylaws empower their respective boards to manage and govern property, facilities, and services, including the adoption of policies and rules. Laguna, Mutual, Laguna Woods Mutual Number 50 Bylaws 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Third Laguna Hills Mutual Bylaws 2.1.3, 2.2.3, and 2.3. The United Laguna Woods Mutual Bylaw 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Where therefore the Board of Directors acknowledges the cable television cable slash internet is jointly administered amenity of both the Housing Mutuals and the Golden Rain Foundation Corporation. Now therefore be it resolved on November 7th, 2017 that the Board of Directors of this Golden Rain Foundation Corporation and the Board of Directors for each of the Housing Mutuals each possess the power to take disciplinary action against their respective mutual members, including but not limited to the suspension of cable slash internet and internet services. There it would be cable, television, and internet services. Resolve further, it is within the sole authority of the Golden Rain Foundation to negotiate the terms of the master contract, including but not limited to pricing and programming. Resolve further, it is the sole obligation of the Golden Rain Foundation to develop, maintain, operate, and or repair the facilities necessary to provide a cable television slash internet for the mutual members, qualifying residents, co-occupants, tenants, and their guests. Resolve further, this resolution cancels and supersedes resolution 90-06-110.
Staff recommends that the board members postpone this resolution for no less than 30 days from the postponement to comply with Civil Code 4360. Uh, again, because of the 24 days before our October meeting, we move to November 7th. I move to accept this resolution. Do we have a second? I second. Okay, it was moved by Judith Chief Troutman Chief. and seconded by Joan Millman. Any discussion? Yes. Director Beckett. Um, I have a question let's, about... Let's, let's use our speaker buttons, please. I have a question about the uh, internet uh, service being suspended. Um, the uh, company that owns the internet service, they charge me twenty three fifty a month and they take it out of my bank account, uh, auto check. Is there some provision for that? Well, I think that's, that's really between the customer and that third party provider. What we own is the pipe. And when you are being disciplined by one of these boards and your access to the pipe is denied, uh, it is a, a fact, and, and I wouldn't say incidental, but it is that, that all service that comes through that pipe will be disconnected. And so we felt it prudent to identify all the services that go through that pipe. So when your access to it is denied for disciplinary reasons, uh, there won't be a surprise. And I would think as a consumer, if you're not receiving a service, you call up and say, I'm not paying for it. Give me a, give me a rebate or don't, send the, don't take the money. This is one of the most effective tools we have for people who are delinquent in, in money they owe this community. And of all the actions that you can take, this, this has proven to be the most effective. And what we're doing by this resolution the way it used to work is the mutual would say, this person is delinquent in their fines, whatever, and we are asking GRF to cut off the cable service. So then you have to wait another whole month for GRF to take that action. So what we've done is we've worked with our legal counsel in conjunction with the legal counsel of the, the mutuals, and we've reached an agreement where we can empower the mutual, when they already have made the decision of this is what they want to do, to make that action immediate. And, and so what it's going to think, things will happen faster, the money will be collected faster. So it's, it's looking at our whole compliance system and trying to get a faster um, time when the fine is levied to where the pe person has a, um, actually has to deal with that. So it's, it's almost a housekeeping situation. Joan, I see your name on the. Yes, I have a couple of small Scribners and uh, an insert that was left out. So on, uh, on the first page, on page two of three, um, the last wherefore, Please take the apostrophe out after mutuals on the second line. It's not a possessive. And the same thing in the next paragraph, the third line down for, for each of the housing mutuals, no apostrophe. And then we inserted internet after television, which you had, but I think we left off the final paragraph that's that was resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. That was omitted. Should be the last paragraph. Okay. okay. Uh, Richard, I have you on my screen. Yeah, I have, yes. Um, I have a concern. Uh, I can understand cutting off television, but when you get to the internet, some of the the problem is you can't, you, you can't, you can't separate them. Well, what way, I haven't finished what I'm saying. I realize you've got a problem there, but what my concern is if somebody has an emergency, they can't use their cell phone, I mean their phone. Then what happens? Who has the liability? 
You can use your phone, you just can't use the internet part, which means you'll be using data on your phone. You can still use your phone, but you'll be using data if you can't connect the phone to internet. And most phone services is what happens. If the internet's on, you can't. Yeah. If it's a VOIP phone. <coughs> I, I can't answer that or address that because, you know, I have, don't have a landline. And, I, and when I had a landline, I didn't have our service in here. So, I'll does just the phone stop? The question. Hmm? No, the phone doesn't stop just because you don't have internet. Okay, so then I, I guess we're, it's okay data. that the phone still works. If, if, no. you have, if you have an AT&T or a hardwired phone, then it shouldn't impact it. But it would be my understanding that, it, like, my phone is VOIP. It's voice over internet. Yeah. And if my internet goes down, then my phone goes down. That's right. Mm -hmm. And and I'll really, this resolution is just giving the, the United and Third the ability to do this so that it doesn't have to come to us to do it. This isn't a big change, correct? And I kind of have a memory that we, this came up when we discussed it, and that in the letter, that would notify the person that if they do not pay the fine, that their service will be disconnected, that we were going to put in that letter that that would include their phone service if they were on the internet phone. So that they would be warned ahead of time that if they don't pay it and that gets suspended, it would include that. So that that's something I think we have to be, okay. Well. Uh, can we uh, pass that on to our attorney to see if that's legitimate? Well, that, it is legitimate. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think we. I think it's already been discussed. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. I have. Now I have Beth on, on my speakers list. In sitting on the third board, I was just astounded that there is so little that that we as a board can do to people who do not follow through and pay their fees and their disciplinary action is so so minimal of what we can do and this one piece of having your television turned off and or and your internet is something that gets folks attention so they will pay their fees and and having been a member on third board, it makes me very happy to have us be able to give them the option of being able to say, okay, we've gone through the process, it's time to be able to get to this place and not have to then send it to GRF and come back to be able to do it. Catherine? Yeah, I'm just gonna comment really to something that uh, Joan said. I'm not sure that it makes sense in this particular resolution that we have the last, <clears throat> that resolution, further that the officers and agents, because there isn't anything for the officers and agents to implement here. The implementation is from the housing mutuals. And so this is really just kind of clearing it up and says we agree to, get to, to transfer that authority. I don't see that that is applicable under this, uh, for this resolution. Okay, so we leave it as is. Annette, did you? I just wanted, uh, Annette Soul 3428C, I just wanted to say that uh, if you don't pay your telephone bill, AT&T cuts off your service. <laughs> All right, I think that we are now at a point where we can vote on this resolution. So uh, all those, uh, let's commence voting. All right, cease voting. And the motion carries, my God, no abstentions, wow. <laughs> All right, moving right along. We are now on 12C, which is to entertain a motion to approve the 2018 GRF business plan resolution. Resolution 90-17XX, resolved September 5th, 2017, that the business plan of this corporation for the year 2018 is hereby adopted and approved. And resolved further, 
that pursuant to said business plan, the board of directors of this corporation hereby estimates that the sum of $36,042,510 will be required by the corporation to meet its annual expenses of operation, from which will be deducted $8,752,078 in various sources of non-assessment revenue. Additionally, $3,056,640 is planned for reserve contributions. The Board of Directors hereby estimates that the net sum of $30,347,072 will be required to be paid by the corporation members in accordance with the terms of that certain trust agreement dated March 2nd, 1964 as amended and the bylaws of this corporation and resolve further that the corporation shall charge each member the sum of $198.57 per month per membership of said corporation for its share of the aforesaid net expenses and reserve contributions for the year 2018. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I saw so moved that we adopt this resolution. Okay, it was moved by Judith Troutman and seconded by Tom Skirkel. Um, discussion? No. Director Beckett. The, uh, the resolve further, the one, two, three, four, fifth line, it says additionally $3 million is planned for reserve contributions. Um, we have two sources of uh, contributions to the reserves. One is the the transfer fee and the other is the assessments. Uh, this, uh, does this mean assessments or uh, what? I did. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Uh, yes, I mean, you know, <clears throat> because this is talking about basically coming out of the, the, the budgeted amount, the amount that is being paid uh, through from the housing mutuals. That's what this is relating to, uh, you know, and, and the transfer fee is totally different and handled totally separately. And is, although it's part of our capital expenditures, it's not part of That's the operating works. budget. Thank you, Catherine. Any other director comments? Juanita Skillman, 2154N. <clears throat> Last month, a proposal was made <clears throat> to reduce the amount going into reserves and send some more back to the housing mutuals. <clears throat> and it was said at that time that the housing mutuals had not indicated any need for that. I'd like to be here today on behalf of United Mutual to say, yes, we do need that. As we went through this budget process, and maybe this is too little too late, we kept being saying, we're cutting it down, we're cutting it down. And it wasn't until last month that we saw the final uh, number, an increase of almost $5 <clears throat> per month, per manor, for our residents, in addition to what we need in our mutual for our operational and reserve budget for all of the fantastic infrastructure uh, things that we need to do that haven't been done for 50 years. So while I, I know it's probably too late to make any changes now, I would like to beg this board as we go forward into the next year, uh, if you keep that amount um, as low as possible, so maybe we can get a rebate at the end of the year, a surplus at the end of the year, to help us out, or at least this time next year when we're looking at the 2019 budget, we're not gonna be looking at a $5 per manor per month increase. Thank you. Maxine McIntosh, 68C. Um, I wish for some clarity uh, in looking in the special packet at uh, what is called line 29. That's the back of the staff report page. Line 29, surplus deficit recovery increased by 1,800,000 due to the elimination plan surplus recovery. And then uh, the operating costs were offset based on mid-year results. 
further surplus funds will not be available to offset the 2018 business plan. Um, I just, what, what happened to the 1,800,000 that was there before? It had no. increased oh, what, what? due well, to the elimination instead of planned surplus recovery. All right, well, no. if you uh, stop talking, we can answer the question. Yeah. What Catherine. It, okay, what, it, what that is in indicating is that we had a surplus coming in when you look at that uh, page. From 2016, there was a surplus coming in. And, and, you know, and as you all know, Golden Rain Foundation tries to make sure that they're re returning to the housing mutuals any surplus because that's, that's the only way we can get it back to you. And that's what that million eight is. So in 2017, the budget then had that surplus, again, you know, to cover expenses to reduce the assessment amount. And what's shown is 2018, there isn't any surplus. Yes. Okay, and so that's why there's none shown there. And so that does affect uh, then the amount of money that, that we require from the housing mutuals then to support operations of GRF. Thank you, that's very clear. I had no trouble seeing it wasn't there. I just didn't know where it disappeared. It, didn't, it, it got spent this year. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> And then uh, my other question, I wanted to know, looking at the uh, uh, GRF, GRF uh, golf expenses uh, throughout here, I see um, um, over 700,000 for the 27 hole maintenance. This is maintenance and about 112 for the eight hole. And then under operations, we have another 545,000 uh, and then about uh, 82, 83,000 for the nine hole. Uh, this totals up to one million three hundred forty thousand one hundred seventy-two dollars, and uh, considering all the service and everything that's provided, I'm not saying that sounds unreasonable. I just wish to know if, if that is the total amount that is needed to run a good golf course. Am I missing any expenses? Can, I'm not sure where you're getting the figure from. That's my. What do we? Which page are you looking at? Okay. Let's see here. All right, on page seven, under landscape division, you get the maintenance there, the figures of 700,172. And then, let's see, where did I get the others? Oh, and then the other is under operations. Where's operations? Um, I'm looking for the operations page. See, I took the information and wrote it down on a sheet of paper. So that was what I wanted. I just want to make sure you took both landscaping and uh, the, yeah. Yeah, maintenance and operations. So I, I think that the number you gave was an accurate figure? Yeah. Didn't see an accurate on here. I'm going to defer to Betty on this, if she would. OK. I'm not sure which numbers you're talking about is my problem. Um, is this operations? Yeah, so um, you can see the total cost of the golf courses combined doing what Maxine is doing, pull the two departments out of golf maintenance, and then there's also two departments in recreation for golf operations. And so it's combining those four departments or, or work centers when we report the consolidated um, cost of the golf courses. So, so you're on the right track. There's four numbers to pull from this report. All right, what do you have under operations? Oh, okay. All right, so Betty, is that the total cost for running a good golf course? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was some overhead it wouldn't include, but Okay. Okay, Mary. That, that, that's oper there's a difference between operations and right. and uh, yeah. reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I'm I'm looking at page number ten, uh, and uh, it shows that your facilities fee, that would be your trust facilities fee, mm -hmm. is increasing by almost two million dollars, and uh, the reduction that you have under your reserve funds. Is only about six hundred and eleven thousand three hundred and 
28. So you have a, a lot of extra money that you're collecting. Uh, and uh, it seems to me like uh, you could have given the housing mutuals that other $5 because that would have not been that much for you to give us. We'll take one or two. Yeah. <laughs> Any discussion for the board? Sounds right. Director. Director Beckett. I'd like to uh, respond to what uh, President uh, Skillman from United said about the fact that the mutuals need the money. When, when I was elected to this board, I ran on the promise that if I was elected, I would spend less money so that there would be more available for the mutuals. But the only resolution that ever came before us was to cut the contribution to reserves. Now, if that had been a resolution to take that money out of the operating budget, I would certainly have voted for it. But there's nothing much I can do today. Thank you. All right. It would appear that we have ceased discussion. So now we are going to vote on the um, resolution. All right, cease voting. John, did you? Okay. All right, the motion carries. So, Judith, we're on to 12. 12. Yes. Resolved September 5th, 2017, that the capital reserve expenditures plan of this corporation for the year 2018 is hereby <coughs> adopted and approved. And hereby, and resolve further, that pursuant to said plan, the sum of $8,337,000 is hereby authorized to be expanded in 2018 for the purposes provided therein, of which $3,487,000 is designated from the equipment fund and $4,850,000 from the facilities fund. And reserve further that the board of directors of this corporation hereby authorizes the transfer of $4,850,000 from monies set aside in the trust facilities fund to offset planned expenditures from reserves as projected in the 30-year funding plan. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I so move we adopt this resolution. All right, it was moved by Judith and seconded by Tom. Um, so discussion. Catherine? Yeah, although the, <clears throat> it's the sum of $8,337,000 uh, sounds high. Sorry. It's basically catching up on some of the expenditures that have already taken place. And so you'll notice that our contributions into uh, reserve is going to be a little bit less than what our anticipated expenditures are. Uh, that's not uncommon, uh, and so it's nothing to be concerned about. And if you look at the curve, when you look at the details, you'll see that uh, because of uh, some of the activities that we're trying to catch up on, we're spending a little more than what we're bringing in, but by next year that turns around. So. There's nothing to be alarmed at relative to the level of expenditure <coughs> compared to the funds that we're uh, including this year or raising this year. Director Beckett. Thank you, Mr. President. <coughs> On the uh, first resolve further, it says that uh, in the last two lines that uh, 4000 $4,850,000 from the facilities fund. And then when you go down to the next mm -hmm. resolve further, it says in the second line, 
uh, transfer of $4,800 for money set aside in the trust facilities fee fund. These are uh, two different funds. And uh, as far as I know, this is the first time we've ever transferred money from the uh, uh, transfer fee fund to the facilities fund. And it, if we look at, if you look at uh, agenda item 13A, page one, it, it uh, lists the uh, purpose of the trust facilities fee uh, in the last line of the second uh, whereas, which it says that the purpose of this uh, trust facilities fee fund is to ensure the continuation of the amenities. Now that's different from what we've always used the uh, facilities fund for. The facilities fund for, has been uh, broadly, more broadly uh, spent. But uh, there are several items in the budget for this year that I don't think would properly come out of the trust facilities fee fund. And uh, I don't think we ever discussed uh, uh, using the entirety of, uh, or taking the entirety of our uh, facilities uh, budget and taking it out of the uh, transfer fee fund. So could I get an explanation of that from uh, staff? Certainly, the trust facility fee started, which we have nicknamed the transfer fee uh, for short, and it started in January 2012. The money's been accumulating in a separate fund called the trust facility fee fund. We have, um, with only one or two exceptions, the GRF board has not spent any of that money, but we use it to um, show as a source of revenue for the entire 30-year plan. And so the facilities fund is such that um, we've been drawing down the facilities fund and building up monies in this other trust facility fee fund. So now's the year when the board needs to transfer. Um, from an accounting perspective, it could go either way. We could just stop spending out of the facilities fund and spend out of the trust facility fee fund for a while um, until the facilities fund builds back up again. But um, with our cost collection and job number system, it would be easier for staff who's coding invoices and projects to continue using the facilities fund. Um, so we opted to do it this way, where the monies that you've been setting aside from that transfer fee, we're going to transfer it into the facilities fund, just to keep the accounting easy. Um, the purpose of that trust facility fee fund is not restricted. It says that it's um, to maintain and improve recreational and other amenities available to all residents. So really, GRF has not posed any limitations on itself for the use of those funds. So it's really is just an accounting method, um, getting it in the resolution so it's authorized. Thank you, Betty. Mm -hmm. Anybody else up there? Oh, my turn. Mary Stone, 356C. Uh, I'm looking at page 14. And on page 14, I'm down towards the bottom, the community center. And I see where $1,355,000 is being taken out of facilities. And it obviously is going to be taken out of some of the trust facilities fee if you are if that is what's happening here. So I'm kind of wondering, since the community center is definitely not a trust facility, is there any problem with that? Diane? I'm gonna, that's like the legal question. This is a Betty issue. I, yeah. I would say no. Yeah, it's my understanding that GRF is operating as trustee. And so although <coughs> the purchase of that um, this building was on the books of GRF. It's GRF as trustee for the trust. So it's really one and the same. Director Beckett. The uh, transfer fee was established for a particular purpose. And uh, As near as I can tell, that was to, it was restricted to the amenities. We have several items in the budget this year 
that uh, I don't consider amenities. For example, we have $750,000 to remodel the third floor of this building to bring security. And uh, we have another $1.3 million to uh, remodel the gatehouses. <coughs> An amenity to me is a recreational facility, and not, not the, uh, the office building and not the gatehouses. So I would oppose this resolution. All right. There being no further discussion, all of those, I'm sorry, Catherine, I didn't see her. <laughs> I was trying to save time. You know, yeah, I'll, just responding to John. If I recall the way it was worded, it wasn't just amenities, it was facilities that are required for the operation of the community and to maintain the facilities of, for the community. And uh, the administration building is a facility to maintain the community because if we didn't have the administration building, we wouldn't have the, we wouldn't have the capability of, as the trustee, to maintain uh, the the community itself and so I think it falls within the, the, the scope uh, of it uh, it's a matter of interpretation I think more than anything else thank you do you have anything new to add yes director Beckett the original the resolution that established the transfer fee says does say recreational and other amenities available to all residents. I don't think you could say that the security building or department is available to all the residents. Sure is. And I All right, thank you. Um, I'd now like to commence voting. We are voting on resolution 9, the capital plan resolution. Please commence voting. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. C's voting. <coughs> All right, the motion carries. Did you abstain? Yeah, I abstained because I missed the third budget planning, and I have information here that makes me question um, our ability to use that money. But, okay. So that's the only reason. All right. It carries. <laughs> we're on to C, which is, no, we're on to E. Hmm? Resolution 9017, whereas Civil Code 5570 requires specific reserve funding disclosure statements for associations, and whereas planned assessments or other contributions to replacement reserves must be projected to ensure balances will be sufficient at the end of each year to meet the association's obligations for repair and or replacement of major components during the next 30 years. Now, therefore, be it resolved, September 5th, 2017, that the board has developed and hereby adopts the replacement reserves 30-year funding plan, which is attached, with the objective of maintaining replacement reserve balances at or above a threshold of $6,800,000 or $800,000 while meeting its obligations to repair and or replace major components. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I so move. I second. All right, it was moved by Judith and seconded by Joan. Um, discussion. <coughs> okay, the uh, first speaker is Joan Millman. I just don't find the attachment for the 30 year plan. Is it in the new one? Yeah, it's, got the, it. they, it's a special handout. Okay, we got it this morning. That's it, okay. Got it. Did you, are you good with that? Okay. Director Beckett. I'm opposed to this spending plan. Two years ago, when we transitioned to self-management, we had $28 million in our reserve account. 
In 2016, our first year of self-management, we overspent our income and the balance in our reserve account fell by several million dollars. In this 2017, our second year of self-management, we again overspent our income and the balance in our reserve account fell by several million more. For next year, management is offering a plan that calls for more of the same. If we approve the spending plan that management is proposing, the amount of money in GRF's reserve account will drop from $28 million to $9 million. If we allow the balance in our reserve account to keep falling, where will we get the money we need for repair and replacement? We'll have to increase association fees. Chris Collins was here from the foundation this morning and she told us that some of our members are struggling to make ends meet. If their association fees, if their association fees go up, many of them will be forced to move out. I believe we should do what our members want and cut spending. Thank you. Sounds like somebody running for office. Um, Catherine? John, I disagree with you in that. I think we've been very careful in the uh, use of our funds. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, when you take a look at where we were in 2014, 2015, what the pro projected expenditures were for this community, we're running from what the projected had been three years ago was to be at this point 108 million in expenditures and we're gonna be down at 98 million. And I think this board and, and the management has been extremely careful. Yes, we have, uh, we have spent, when you look at the reserves, there has been considerable expenditures and part of that has been for the purpose of fixing and maintaining and bringing up to current standards that which had been allowed to decline for many years. We need, the maintenance has been way behind. And I think if you travel through the community, you'll see it. You'll see it in third where they're fixing dry rot. You'll see the issues that we've had here. What we're trying to do, and you'll see the expenditures for this building has been the, trying to consolidate all of the all of the management together into one building. It's far more effective for management to be in one building than it is to be scattered across the countryside. I know that just from my own experiences in, in business. So I disagree that we have been improperly spending money. I think that you're right. You see the, the reserve balance drop, but the reserve balance drop has been the refurbishing of, you know, redoing Clubhouse 2. We're redoing, we've been having to, we tented and we're re, uh, on Clubhouse 4, had never been tented for termites. We've been doing dry rot repair. We got sewer issues we've had in Clubhouse 3. So you can just go down the issue, down the, down and look at all the things that have had to be done in order to maintain this community as as we have all agreed, our goal is to have an enduring community that not only has lasted over 50 years, but is good for another 50 years. And that only occurs when the infrastructure and the facilities are continually maintained. And it takes reserve funding to do it. We're not a city, so it's not easy for us to go out and borrow any funds. And it's not easy, I mean, uh, and, and grants, there's no way that we can get grants from the government to support this community as most, uh, most communities can do. So we have to use our reserves when it's appropriate and we have to continue to build those reserves. All right, uh, all those, um, let's commence voting. And we are voting on reserve funding plan resolution. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's showing. Sorry. Did, did we get a voting screen? There we go. Yeah, well, hold on. We, they were done. Okay, I was going to vote. Can I add a yes? <laughs> Please? Thank you. No, not on this, because I feel very, 
I feel strongly that we are doing what is best for this community. I totally disagree with Director Beckett, which is nothing new. And um, I'd like to also point out that we are subject to audit. We have never had an issue with audits, whatever. Everything we're doing is totally legal and it makes financial sense. Um, now, we have just passed what we call the business plan or the budget. I want to put a caveat on this. And the caveat that I would like to put on this is there has been discussion of early release of funds. And I want to put a caveat that there will be no early release of funds from anything in the 2018 budget until we have a signed contract and are under construction on pickleball and until we have a signed contract with lawn bowling and we have a construction schedule. That is the caveat that I would like to place on Do what we, we So if someone. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to move on that motion. All right, so it's been moved and seconded discussion. Okay, I have Judith as a speaker. Now I have Catherine as a speaker. The motion is to place a caveat that there would be no early release of funds from the 2018 budget until there is a signed contract and construction has commenced on pickleball and that there is a signed contract and a construction schedule for lawn bowling. And I have Judith as a speaker, and then Catherine after that, oh. and then Diane. No, that was to make the motion. You can take it. Okay, out. Catherine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> maybe I'm not as close to the situation as you are, but I'm not sure putting conditions on on uh, on our staff is necessary because I believe they will get the job done as fast as they probably can. I don't have any idea what kind of issues are before them, and whether they got issues possibly with the city, if there's going to be any uh, permitting required. That I don't know. But I'm uncomfortable trying to, to say that uh, we can't continue to work and do those things that are necessary for the community uh, um, to put a condition that two specific items have to be done first. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm just uncomfortable with uh, with with working that way. But I'm not close enough to the details to understand uh, what what is prompting uh, the, that motion. Diane, I'm just not sure what a caveat is. I mean, I know what the word means, but I just don't know if we. It's essentially an hold. Amendment, amendment to hold. Amendment to hold. So we're going to amend the the but the business no, plan. No, 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 no. We passed the business plan. All we're discussing. There has been discussion about early release of funds from what we just passed. Right. And all I'm saying is that GRF has two very high priority projects. On Aug on April fourth, this board passed that we would do a new pickleball facility. Mm -hmm. It is now September 5th, and the progress is less than wonderful. We passed at our August 1st meeting a, a, approval of a contract for the lawn bowling facility. It is now September 5th, there is no signed contract. And these are priority projects. These are identified as priority projects. And so if there is a way to create an incentive to reestablish the priority for those projects, that's all I'm trying to accomplish. So it's actually, uh, I'm making a completely new motion. Got it. It's not amended to what we just passed. I apologize for that. And also, if, if there's an early release of funds, that we would have to vote on. Is that true? Okay. But the fact that there has been discussion about early release, that's okay. Director Beckett. I'm against to, I'm opposed to uh, 
any early release of funds, the uh, trust agreement that uh, created the GRF Trust has a section uh, from the, which the FHA was a party, and they said that as long as the loan is outstanding, that the GRF shall not spend any money beyond its current budget. I think that was in there for a good reason, and that means that reason is financial prudence. And uh, if you have a budget, you stick to the budget. It, otherwise, it means nothing. You just take out money whenever you want. Thank you. Beth. These two items are not only high priority, they're kind of like hot button items. And we've gone around and around with this. And there are so many people that are really involved um, in pickleball and in lawn bowling. And we've made decisions. And I support this motion because I think we just need to really move on with this. And if, and if we don't get going on it, we may be coming back to it again and rediscussing and should we do this and and how how fair is that and how much is it honoring the people who have already worked so hard to get to a place where they want to be with lawn bowling and pickleball Thank you. okay i have tom yeah i, I was Respond, <coughs> Director Beckett. We're not voting on releasing early funds. That's not what this is. We're saying if there is a request for that, we will not do that until these other two conditions are met. This is not a vote on releasing funds early. That's not what this is. Except, except for these two projects. The two projects that are already budgeted, already passed, they're already funded. They're already funded. That's not, the, that's not an early release of money to do those. And those projects are already approved, already budgeted, already funded. We're Richard. saying if someone makes a request for early release of the budget, any money that we just passed, we're not going to consider it until these other budgeted items are already started. That's, that's for new projects, just like Clubhouse 3. You know, I didn't get my $2,500 this year. Well, I could fuss all I no, want. No, it was $2.5 million. $2.5 <laughs> So I could fuss all I want. They're not going to give me an early release so I can finish my project. So it's to keep people like me shut up, quiet. You know what I mean? So let's. Richard. Thank you. Laurie, can you t is there any explanation of why there's delay? in these two projects? I think the difficulty with lawn bowling is because the company's in Australia and we've been pushing really hard to try to get their signature even electronically and we haven't been able to, although we continue to do that. And then with regard to pickle, um, the city is not at fault there. We are trying uh, diligently and they've they put it as a priority project to get it reviewed and approved, the site plan review. Um, we are going uh, simultaneously with construction drawings. I'm hoping that's going to catch us up a little bit and we'll be able to get something uh, going here pretty quick within the next 30 days, hopefully, on pickle. So why, why is there a need to put these conditions in? Richard. Mm -hmm. I know. <laughs> okay. I don't want to go public on everything. Certain certain staff my, has ideas. My and frustration no level ideas. has ex has. <laughs> no, I mean, it's. Uh, I just think it clarifies the GRF priority regarding these projects. That's about as diplomatic as I can be. One more thing I could say. It's to ensure that staff stays um, on board with the priority projects instead of getting tied up with new projects that they got early funds for and then f put pickleball back on the, on the burner again, on the back burner, because now they got this new project they got this newfound money from. You know what I mean? So we have to just help keep them 
in line with what we have to get done first before we start new projects or fund for new projects. Okay, is that any clearer? Catherine, you're on my list again. Are you? Is it? Okay. Mary Stone, 356C. Once again, all I can say is I think staff does does their job, and and I think that it that this is a totally unnecessary motion to make because some people have priorities that to other people that aren't on the top of the list for other people. Pickleball and and lawn bowling is would not be the top of the list for some other people, and I believe that staff is not going to ask for early. Uh, uh, funding for the 2018 projects unless it's an important item. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please commence voting. This is not what we're voting on. It's a brand new motion. Oh. Again, just do a hand vote. Okay. All right. It didn't. It didn't go into the computer on this system. So we, we'll just do all those in favor. And I can restate the motion. The motion is. The motion is that. Should there be a request for early release of funds, the pickleball would be have a signed contract and be under construction, and there would be a signed contract for lawn bowling with a construction schedule before such a request would be considered. So all those in favor of this motion. Opposed? Okay, did you get that? No. Okay. Only one opposed. One opposed, but I think not everybody voted, so. I think everyone voted. Okay. All right. Everybody voted. All right. So, moving right along. He was the no or the abstain. Okay. Just first, Catherine was a no, and John was an abstention. That's correct. So that's you had eight, eight yes, one no, one abstention. Correct. Okay. I voted yes. I voted four times today. <laughs> Exercising my right. Thirteen <laughs> eight. All right. Trying to find it. Okay, 13A, um, entertain a motion to increase the trust facility fee from 2,500 to 5,000. Whereas, as trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation Trust, the board of directors of the Golden Rain Foundation is required to maintain and improve the recreational and other amenities available to all residents of Laguna Woods Village. And whereas the board of directors finds that reinstatement of the capital contribution to the trust originally required to be made for each manor sold will ensure that continuation of the amenities that make Laguna Woods Village unique. Now, therefore, be it resolved December 6, 2016, that as trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation Trust, a declaration of trust recorded on March 6, 1964, the board will impose a fee to be known as the trust facilities fee. In accordance with all terms and conditions contained in this policy statement and in California Civil Code 4580, as amended by the Senate Bill 1128, Stats 2010, Chapter 322, Section 2, effective January 1, 2011. On all transactions involving the purchase of a separate interest in any of the trust store's common interest developments, United Laguna Woods Mutual, Third Laguna Hills Mutual, and Mutual 50, each of which is hereafter referred to as a trust store within the city of Laguna Woods as an obligation of the purchasers. <coughs> effective January 1st, 2018, for purposes of determining the effective date, 
purchase contracts entered prior to January 1, 2018, in which escrow opens before January 1, 2018, and closes on or before March 31, 2018, are deemed transactions occurring prior to the effective date, and resolve further that trust facilities fees will be a fixed amount as provided herein with the determined from time to time by the trustee of the Golden Rain Foundation Trust. The entirety of each such fee, when and as paid by the purchasers, shall be deposited into the trust facilities fund and shall be applicable to all such transactions, excluding the following transfers of a separate interest. Number one, where ownership of a separate interest is joined between a current beneficiary of a trustor and a non-beneficiary spouse, domestic partner, or other relative of such beneficiary. Two, where ownership of a separate interest is transferred to a non-beneficiary of a trustor by gift or through inheritance from a, from a beneficiary of a trustor. Three, where ownership of a separate interest is transferred by a beneficiary of a trustor to the current qualifying resident as defined in the bylaws of each trustor of the separate interest, where the transferor has never been a qualified resident and has previously paid a trust facilities fee. Or, number four, where ownership of a separate interest is being transferred to a trust whose settler or principal beneficiary is the transferor or the another or to another trust of estate planning purposes. Resolve further, affected with escrows opened or purchase contracts signed on or after January 1st, 2014, the trust facilities fees shall be set at $5,000 for units with a sale price of $75,000 or higher and $2,500 for units that sell below $75,000 until modified by the trustee. And resolve further in accordance with California Civil Code 4580, each new purchase of a separate interest in any of the trustor's common interest developments within the city of Laguna Woods to which the trust facilities fee applies, in other words, all new purchases other than a transfer qualifying for any of the exclusions set forth in paragraph one through four above, shall in compliance with California Civil Code 4580 have the option to either I pay for fees in its entirety at the time of transfer or I, I pay the fee amount purchased to an installment plan, payment plan for a period of seven years. If the further, if the purchaser elects to pay the fee in installment payments under the second of the above statutorily permitted options, then the trustee may also collect additional amounts not to exceed the actual costs for billing and financing on the amount owed as set forth below and in compliance with the Davis-Sterling Act, as the same may be amended from time to time. And if the purchaser sells their separate interest prior to the end of the installment payment plan period, he or she shall pay the remaining balance of the fee owed to the trustee prior to transfer. A fee of $10 will be, impo will be imposed for any late payments. The Golden Rain Foundation Board shall assess a one-time fee for the preparation of the promissory note. The Golden Rain Foundation Board shall also assess a handling fee of $252 until later modified by the board and interest, if applicable, at the minimum rate allowed by law. The monthly payment of the trust facilities fee and handling fee and interest, if applicable, shall be due on the first day of each month. And resolve further, Resolution 90-16-54, adopted December 6, 2016, is hereby superseded and canceled to the extent that it differs effective January 1, 2018. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move we accept this resolution. All right, it was moved by Judith and seconded by Joan. Um, discussion. Okay. okay. Uh, first, I have Joan. Okay. Again, just a couple of Scribners. In the second whereas, please put a comma 
on the second line, after trust and after sold. It's a parenthetical expression. Um, again, under resolve further down the page, where it starts the trust facilities fee, the third line down, um, a comma after when, now I think, the entirety of each such fee, when, and as paid by the purchasers, comma. Okay, it's minor, but. And I'd, I'd like to just say that after every year, whether it's 2014 or 2016, if it's in the middle of a sentence, there is a comma, and that's a rule. And I hate to keep just correcting it, but that's really something that Joanne and I are bugged about. So just a caution in the future. Thanks. Uh, it's it's um, it says the entire under the resolve further the trust to, the f trust facilities fee is the start and then the second sentence the entirety of each such fee comma when comma and is paid by the purchaser comma I know it's thank you it's crazy but okay director Beckett uh, I voted for this first time it came up but. I'm going to vote no today because I think that the transfer fee has restrictions that are not being honored. Thank you. Diane. I just had a question um, on page two of two. The first resolve further. I just was, I didn't understand the reference to the 2014. Uh, it's an example. It was just an example of uh, the the 2014 comma is correct, but we don't always adhere to the comma after the the date, and that's all. I'm no, I just mean, about. why are we referring to 2014 in here? That's when they reinstated it. I thought it was 2012. Which they changed it in 2014. Yeah. It started at 1500. So this is perhaps when it went to two, to 2500. Is that okay? I thought I just wanted to confirm. Okay, Catherine. That's Okay. Did the secretaries get the 18? Yeah, it should be. It should be 18. Okay. And that right. wouldn't make any sense. Okay, Catherine, you have. We'll give him four years grace period. We don't want to. It's okay, I think, but it must have been there in 2004. Right. The comma was okay with you as well. Yeah, I'm going to, I will I will vote for this, and I'm, and I'm going to vote for this, and I'm pleased to see that we uh, responded and recognized that the Towers has a unique situation and that 19 of the 38 reported sales in the last, I don't know, 18 months or however long period it is, are under $75,000. And so to raise that to 5,000, I think would be uh, not appropriate. Uh, when um, in other, the other mutuals, I think the minimum prices tend to be over 200,000 up to about 1.2 million. So I think we're just recognizing the situation for one of our housing mutuals. Somebody's getting hungry. <laughs> one o'clock. You're getting hungry. Well, well, my recorder doesn't go past one. So. All right, Richard. Yeah, I would like to amend the motion uh, for uh, prices under 75000 that the uh, fee be raised to $3,000 instead of 2500 Why? Are you making a motion? Yes. Do you have a second? All right, it's been moved by Richard and seconded by Director Beckett to raise the fee, the transfer fee for units under 75,000 to 3,000. Discussion? Okay. 
Yeah, I well, in our normal uh, habit here, we have houses priced at some over a million dollars, two hundred thousand dollars, and they still pay the five thousand, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, it's I don't see any difference in in raising the twenty five to three thousand. It's right there. Those are rated to make it proportional. So you're saying that you, it should be more proportional to a certain sale amount instead of... You don't want to do that. Ex well, uh, you can't... Discriminated have, against one mutual? Yeah, but you can't, mm -hmm. you can't define it into a lot more yeah. detail. I'm just saying, and this way you have it. Under, over 75 and under 75. And under 75, I just wanted to raise the 3,000 instead of 2,500. This is thought about a five hundred dollar increase. Well, I speak in opposition to it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. We went through this quite a bit the other day. Doesn't mm -hmm. need my, they can hear me. Oh. Not, they can't at home. Yeah. They can't at home. I'm opposition in opposition to this. I think it's a fair for twenty five hundred dollars. We've talked about this time and time again, and we, we keep rehashing it. We've got to give them some kind of a break. Well, we are. <laughs> okay, folks, we're out of order. Yeah. And to put us back in order, the next speaker on my list is Catherine. Yeah. You know, I, I, I disagree with the amendment. Uh, raising it $500 is more just to say, well, the, because we're increasing it, we've got to increase it for them also. And, and I'm not sure that it's going to, that, it's appropriate under the circumstances. I think that leaving that part uh, the same is, is, uh, is in my opinion, uh, the way we should go. There's no reason to, to raise it, just to raise it. We're not, we're, we're actually raising the, the fee to 5,000 for a much different purpose. And at the time we had proposed it, a little, most of us did not recognize the value that uh, some of the units in uh, the towers were selling for. And so this is just being more aware of what the situation is within the community. So I'm opposed to, to your motion. Uh, I understand where you're coming from, but I disagree. Okay. I had Director Beckett on my screen, but then I don't have him on my screen. So do you wish to speak, Director Beckett? Okay. All right. That being the case, we are going to vote. All of those in favor of this motion, and because this didn't get into the computer, I think we just raise our hands. Right. It's, 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 is this the amended it's motion? Amended. It's amended. <laughs> this it's is, amended. we're voting on the it's amendment. The, amend. the amendment. So we're voting on the amendment, which is to, for units under 75,000 to raise the transfer fee to 3,000. So if you're voting yes, you're in favor of the 3,000. So all those in favor of this motion, raise your hand. Amendment. Amendment, yeah. It's a motion still, even if it's okay. an amendment, okay. right? Okay. Yes. Well, He's yeah, just screen. Yeah. So it's the amendment. Well, that, the screen doesn't have the amendment. It's a motion that we're voting on. So if you're in favor of the $3,000, put your hand up. All right, if you're opposed. All right, now we're voting on. Okay. All right, now we're back to the original resolution. And so that is that we're raising the transfer fee to 5,000 except for units selling for $75,000 or less where there will be no change and that will remain $2,500. So all those, all those in favor of the motion, Original and I motion. think we should have a, a voting screen on this one. Yeah, we did a minute ago. Yeah, increase the Okay, here we are. Okay. So all those in favor of this motion, cease voting. I made the original motion. Yeah, the yeah after I read it. Joan. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so now we've ceased voting. We haven't even done committee reports. <laughs> Who did not vote? I voted. And Di Diane abstained? Diane? Oh, okay. oh, you voted? I voted. Oh, that was on the, oh, that was the amendment. Put the names up again. Mm -hmm. It showed the circle. That okay, hang on, it. hang on. <clears throat> so, Director Becca, your vote was? Yes. And Pierce? Yes. Okay, so then there should be 10 votes, yes. There's no opposition, right? Yeah, since you voted. Yeah. Okay. Then we're going with 10. Okay. okay, now, if believe it or not, we're on 13C. Hmm. And Lori, will you please discuss this? Yes, um, if you look at your <coughs> packet under 13C, uh, there's some really good maps in here that Ernest, Ernesto provided. And I will call your attention to oh, sorry. 13C attachment two, one. Yeah, page one, attachment one, page one of one, and attachment two, page two of two. You can see where the sidewalk is, and it is uh, within our gates. And we have been maintaining it, so our recommendation is to just convey, to, to accept the willow conveyance over to GRF. Okay, so we simply need a motion on this? Yes. I'll make a motion to uh, accept the conveyance. Okay, it has been moved by Catherine and seconded by Ray to um, approve the conveyance of the sidewalk. And we, we have a voting screen in front of us if there's no discussion. Well, yeah, I had discussed. Okay. I just needed some clarity. So the $2,500 is only for them to pay the docu for the documents or we're paying for the documents? We're going to pay for the documents. And we're conveying the sidewalk to them? No, they're no, conveying they're to, to us. us. Yeah. Okay. That's, and okay. it should be that's 2100 not 25 right. Okay. That's yeah. what I need to know. And Beth? I have a question. Just in driving by there, I'm thinking, why, why was it ever owned by the Willows? I, I, don't, I don't get it. The fence is there. The Willows people can't get over into the sidewalk. I, I'll bet it had something to do with the real estate market at the time. The sidewalk was done later. Yeah. There's something that's my understanding. Oh, no. we, we've discussed this before. And that's what happened. Oh, we've discussed this? Yeah, this no, is... no, I mean, I've never been involved in the discussion on this, but oh. my guess is the reason that there's something called the Willows is because Cortese had to make some fast money. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, they could easily do it with uh, uh, San Maria. Well, and there's... The same all... situation. See? Yeah, okay. The same type of thing is what I'm saying. Okay, there being no further... Wait, dis I, I have mine in <laughs> Sorry, my question is, on Santa Maria, there's a sidewalk. <coughs> we can't expand that because we, it's not owned by Laguna Woods. I was just wondering if that is somehow owned by the Willows, and can we say, yes, we'll take this, if you'll also give us the other one? The city owns that. Well, that's my question. Is it the city Santa or? Maria owns, yeah. city owns the city. Yeah. The city owns the actual side. Okay, just checking, just confirming. <laughs> okay, there being no further discussion, all those in favor of this motion. Okay, cease voting. The motion carries. Okay, now we are on 13D, which is to entertain a motion to approve Village Television Program to include the Jewelry Channel. And um, this came up at the Media and Communications meeting, and it's kind of a, uh, it's at no cost to us. It is a potential revenue source, not great, but um, it's it's an opportunity. There, it's kind of a no, no loss possible win. And one of the other wins that I see is we teach jewelry making, mm -hmm. and it, it people can look at, see what the professionals are doing, and maybe get some ideas and some inspiration. Mm -hmm. So I would like to entertain a motion. I so move. Okay. I second. Okay, it was moved by Beth and seconded by Joan 
to approve the village television programming to include the jewelry channel. Okay. Discussion? Jude? Is this going to cost us anything? No. Nope. So, okay. It says no cost. Okay. <laughs> Director Beckett. Is this going to be a program on TV6 or is it going to have its own channel? It's called Village Television, John. I'm sorry, on Village Television. All right, there being no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please. I, I want to make a comment. Uh, I, I object to this for one reason. I think it's going to be in competition with the people that live here that make jewelry and sell it. It's, it's, it's a totally different marketing system. I mean, this is somebody looks at their TV, wants to buy it, and they buy it. Our people have shows and displays, and they make things to order and so on. I, if anything, I think it uh, is, is compatible as opposed to competitive. Well, has, has anybody talked to the jewelry people about this? No. Catherine? Yeah, I don't uh, personally, and, but I'm not in jewelry making. If anything, it's going to be a benefit to them because they'll have ideas. They'll get separate ideas of things they might be able to do themselves in the jewelry shop. You know? <gasps> Admittedly, there's some people in there that are making jewelry, and they go down to the to the fall dust, you know, to the festival and they sell it and everything. Uh, but we don't, you know, they have, I think, what, once a year, twice a year, they may have a show where people can go by. But I think this is a total benefit to the community and it's income for us. I don't think it's, it's, it's not as if it's going to compete with anybody. Jewelry is very individual anyway for most of us. I mean, what you like is not necessarily what I might like or what, uh, what Judith would like or or Beth, you know, it's very individual. And so it doesn't make any difference. It's not as if you're selling cars. <laughs> okay, there being no further dis there being no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion to approve village television programming to include the jewelry channel and PAC twelve is not part of this. No. no. <laughs> it's it's on our screen. I know, I know. Okay, so we're voting jewelry channel only. All those in favor, press the magic button. All right, cease voting. Okay, it goes 10 0. Now we're up to committee reports, and it's only 107. <laughs> <coughs> And the, the first committee report. Just a reminder, you do have two o'clock appointments, so. Well, they can wait. We're going to eat. And we're going to take as long as we need to. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough what we do in this job, and we're supposed to gobble our food? No. OK. And you use the word job loosely. Huh? Job. <clears throat> Unpaid job. All right. So I am looking for the second page so I know finance is usually first. Yep. So may I begin? Yes. Please. Okay. We definitely do have the slides, I, I, I think. But okay. So first, I'll give you a couple of quick updates. Um, the As for the charitable organization, what, what we're calling the Village Community Fund, uh, that task force, the attorney who is possibly going to uh, help us pro bono um, has some um, uh, some family problem, family in Texas, and so um, understandably that's his heart, highest priority, and so we may still need somebody to help us with that if there is anybody in the village that either can help or does know of someone. Who I would appreciate hearing about them. Uh, the Select Audit Task Force, um, I would say that the request for proposal for the 2017 audit um, that should go out this week. Um, I think it was this, yeah, this week. Okay, and now 
uh, for the actual finance committee meeting, um, I like to say I'll be sh I'll be brief. The one thing we we took uh, Merrill Lynch and BlackRock were there, but also so were um, Beecher Carlson, who is our insurance uh, broker, and uh, Dan Yost, who is the VMS risk analyst. Um, he explained the importance for all condominium and co-op owners to purchase what's called an H06 policy, and it's to prevent against unexpected expenses, um, perhaps the most important of which is a special assessment in case the either the mutual or GRF has some sort of underinsured or uninsured loss. So um, people often ask, and I think there's going to be something in the breeze or some other communication about this, but if you're a homeowner, an HO6 policy is the one that you should have, whether it's called a condominium policy, but it's my understanding it's for the condominium owners as well as the co-op owners. Uh, the only other thing I'll mention is that we did discuss two of the fees that were mentioned today, but we also discussed uh, the golf fees, and uh, there was an increase there. I'll just give you the one for the 27-hole course. We were going to increase for 18 holes from $11 to 13 and for nine holes there it would be from 6 to $7. Uh, there's also an increase on the par 3 course uh, from uh, for 18 holes from 8 to $9, and for nine holes from four to five. Um, the fees for guests uh, stayed the same, except we eliminated a discount rate, an evening discount rate. And uh, there also is this new, uh, new fee that will be imposed, or new rate, for people who are non-member occupants. And they will now pay a, uh, some, a fee that is between, it's in the medium, so it's between the member price and the guest price or the guest rate, so that what it amounts to is $24 for 18 holes and $13 for nine holes during the week. And um, on the weekend, it's 34 for 18 and 18 for nine. Those are on the big course. And for the par three course, it's $13 for 18 holes and $6 for nine holes. Uh, and then the other fee that we discussed were the room rentals. We currently are charging 10% uh, of the hourly rate um, to of, of what it costs for us uh, to the people who use it, and now it's going to go up to 25%. And now, uh, hopefully, the slides are good, and we, I'll cue the slides, and I'll... Diane, before you... Yep. All the things you just mentioned, the golf and the room rate, will be discussed at the CAC meeting, which occurred, happens this Thursday. Right. Because those are not approved, they're, they're proposed. Right, we just discussed, right, yeah. okay. sorry about that. Okay, I'm going to assume the slide's going to come up and just tell you that through the reporting period of July 31st, 2017, total revenue for GRF was uh, $23.2 million compared to expenses of 23.7, and this results in a net expense of $417,000. Got it. Looks like it's working. Next slide. This next chart shows activity and operations separate from reserves. After backing out depreciation, which is not funded through operations, we can see bottom line we had an operating deficit of $1.3 million through July. The board planned for an operating deficit of $1.8 million this year as a means of returning prior year's surplus to members. So we think we're still on board to get to the $1.8 million. Uh, slide three, please. When comparing these results to budget, the most significant variances were attributable to uh, temporary help and overtime unbudgeted expenditures required to, ex to address service levels in resident services resulting from higher call volume and extended hours and additional hours in fitness, legal fees, unfavorable variance primarily due to payment of a judgment, consulting fees, unfavorable due to higher support than budgeted for financial software <clears throat> excuse me, system to address infrastructure and accounts receivable billing issues, and uh, building repair and maintenance. Uh, unfavorable, primarily due to the remediation of the water line, water line break at Clubhouse 4, and we do expect reimbursement for that from El Toro Water District. We can move on to slide five. I'm sorry, slide 
Yes, yeah, slide four. On this pie chart, we show the non-assessment revenues received to date of $6 million by category, starting with the largest revenue generating operation, which is broadband services, trust facility fees, and so on. These revenues help offset, uh, offset operating costs and keep the assessments down. S slide five, please. Expenses to date of 23.7 million are shown in this pie chart, with the largest category being compensation, followed by depreciation, cable TV, and utilities. And slide six, which is, should be our last slide. This is the reserve and contingency fund balances as of July 31st, 2017. Um, additions to reserves have totaled uh, th uh, nearly $3.7 million year to date, uh, just over $2 million from assessments, $1.4 million from the trust facilities fee, and about $200,000 was interest. So although the fund balances show a combined balance of $33.5 million per books, we have many projected expenditures approved by the board through the capital plan or via supplemental appropriation. And after considering these commitments, the unencumbered balance uh, shown is $13.6 million, so <coughs> above our um, $6.8 million threshold. That's it for the slides. Um, and for my report, we will, we will not have a meeting in September, so our next meeting will be Wednesday, October 23rd at 1.30 in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. The next... Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I noticed that we uh, are taking the payment of a judgment out of the legal fees category. Is that common practice? Well, what would you call it if you didn't call it a legal yeah. fee? Well, a legal fee means the attorney fees to me. And uh, I don't know where you would put it, but... Can you, can you tell us what, the, uh, what kind of a, a judgment that was? Well, John, I think you're aware of that judgment. No, I'm not. Well, I don't know which one it refers to. Well, which was the biggest one we had? Oh, I see. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, community activities, um, Beth. We did not have a meeting this past month. We will have a meeting this month next, on Thursday the 7th at 1 o'clock in this room. And the two hop hot topics will be what was discussed by Diane, fees and room rentals. So. Thank you, Beth. Uh, media and communications. Um, we, we only realized this morning I was notified that the chair of this committee would not be present, so Joan has graciously consented to do a... I'll do my best, okay. A um, couple things. Uh, Chuck updated us on uh, broadband services and the website, which is very exciting, and told us it would be released, and it has been, and we're all looking, looking at it and making... Corrections, additions, and enjoying it totally. Um, one of the things that came up was uh, we needed a mission statement for Village Television, and that's going to be worked on by a separate committee appointed at that time. The docent tour and new resident orientation video has been updated and will be finalized in the next two weeks. The Village Television logo, uh, we've asked for more, more examples. <coughs> so it's still being worked on. Uh, Chuck gave us uh, updates on uh, programming, uh, including uh, a new, new purchase to PAC. Uh, and it was discussed as being available through outside sources who want the channel. So. CBS is coming up for renewal and it's quite expensive, so there's quite a bit of discussion going on there. Um, we're converting from analog to digital television and we were supposed to be doing that by the first of the year. And Chuck had suggested that um, 
we do the removal of analog television through a phased approach. And it was also suggested that we give a lot of publicity to the fact that this is happening. Um, and that's pretty much what we were doing. A lot of discussion about, oh, potential for clubs uh, using the remaining commercial airtime. That's a, a possibility that's coming up. And again, that'll be brought back for a discussion next time. And our next meeting will be October 23rd at 1, one o'clock. Okay, that's it. Thank you, John. Uh, Lance, <coughs> excuse me, Landscape did not have a meeting. However, our next meeting is at 9 a.m. here in the boardroom on September 21st. So now, MNC, Judith. Okay, on July 13th. Uh, this year, the GIF board approved a resolution authorizing staff to submit plans to the city of Laguna Woods for land use permits for a pickleball facility on the corner of Malton Parkway and Gate 16. We also authorized staff to restripe courts 9 and 10 at the tennis facility for combination tennis slash paddle tennis use. Therefore, there was no GRF MNC meeting in August, and the next meeting will be Monday, September 18th, 1 p.m., here in the boardroom. Agenda items for that day are the project log, pickleball courts update, performing arts center update, Clubhouse 2 Annex shuffleboard courts, Clubhouse 2 Annex restoration project. And if you have an interest in any of those projects, please attend on September 18th. The GRF Performing Arts Center ad hoc committee will meet tomorrow, September 6th at 1 p.m. here in the boardroom. The SVA will present their 40-page design summary from all the data that they collected during the user group workshops. Individuals that did not participate in a workshop are encouraged to come tomorrow to have their individual input. Uh, there is a, a website, or on our Laguna Woods website, there's a section for the Clubhouse 3 PAC update that I do monthly, but uh, it has not been put back on yet. Uh, it will be back there if you're looking for updates for the PAC, uh, I think within the week or so, they said. It's because we, we did the w website, and they're trying to find the appropriate uh, place to put it. And that concludes my uh, MNC report. All right. Tom, security. I'm oh, sorry. Director Beckett. Pardon me for asking a stupid question, but uh, I didn't get a copy of the MNC report. Did the committee decide that uh, we're not going to tear down the existing pickleball courts? That'll be discussed at that meeting. No, no decision's been made. That's why it's on the agenda. For next month. We'll discuss that on the 18th, what we want to do with that, those courts in that area. That's September, September 18th, 1 p.m. <laughs> here in the boardroom. MNC, GRF MNC. Well, those courts question? will remain. <laughs> until there's something to, something to replace them. And then they'll go down. Well, we don't know. Come to the meeting. <laughs> Come to the meeting. We don't know yet. We'll see what staff is thinking. Telling you. All right. okay. okay, we are now on security gate access, Tom. I have a, a request for CAC for Beth um, prior to my report. Um, Mr. Don Fleming has asked to become a resident advisor to the CAC. Uh, can I ask him to attend your meeting so that you can evaluate that? Who is he? Who? To attend, I'm sorry, to attend what? Uh, uh, the president of the men's golf. That he would like he to would attend. He would like to attend. He would like to, you know, and see if you, you know, I've talked to, to, to Brad and to Lori. They both work with him and think he's very qualified. So I'll tell him to attend your meeting. Attend the meeting and then we'll make the decision. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying, no, that's, okay. We met, security met on August 24th. I'll make it quick. Uh, we, disaster preparedness. Uh, on the 29th, uh, Chief Moy had a, a large barbecue at Clubhouse 2 for uh, good neighbor building captains. Uh, they passed out vests with name tags and very professional looking vests to all of them so that they can be identified in a disaster. Um, they had food, raffles, the mayor was there. It was a very nice, nice thing. Uh, several um, staff members and security people on August 21st 
uh, tentative workplace violence training that was done by the Orange County Sheriff's Department, which continues to be an issue and we keep training and hopefully we won't have any of those incidents. Um, in regards to statistics, there was mentioned earlier by community members about deaths in our, uh, <clears throat> in our village. Unfortunately, deaths continue to plague us. Uh, not major ones, but anything you leave out. The chief and I have mentioned, hide it, lock it, or lose it. Keep an eye on your stuff. Do not leave things out. Um, and call security if you see anyone suspicious, uh, and they'll come out and check them out. Uh, there was a proposal by the chief on a business pass policy. Didn't go over real well. A lot of the committee members uh, shot it down because it had to do with everything from a major construction to somebody who's just coming in to replace your door. Uh, what I've asked him to do and he's working on is a new proposal just dealing with major construction people who come in here and park and do all kinds of things they're not supposed to do. And that will be for our next meeting which is scheduled for October. October, yes, 26th. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Ray, traffic? Yeah, the traffic hearing was quite an interesting one this, this uh, past uh, couple of weeks. We had uh, 12 people appear. One of the 12 appeared for 11 violations. Oh, my wow. <clears throat> Very important. What Tom was just saying, it has to do with the business pass application, and we're going to work on that. What happened is that a contractor was in here for all of these different things. They slept in the house overnight. They had parties a couple of times. They left their vehicles parked and so forth and so on. That will be spelled out. That's what the chief is working on. That will be spelled out on this particular form. But that was very interesting to have the situation. The people don't live here. They live someplace else, and they're getting their house fixed. They just bought so this is a very important situation. That's why I say it's a little odd. Uh, here again, on a situation we have most of our traffic hearings are because of stop signs. We also get some situations where the people are really upset and say, why don't our security people give us, let's make a deal. Let's play, you know, give us a, a, a deal out there. What happens is that we, on the traffic committee, take care of that. And that is what is called suspend or void the notice of violation. There are situations that occur that we hear our officers are told not to go ahead and play, let's make a deal. We also have a situation, if you haven't attended traffic school for three years, you can go to traffic school and you find as much less. It, it may, we make a lot of difference, and Chief Moy, is, is, as Tom said, is doing a tremendous job. We're trying to put things across to people, and hopefully we'll, we'll uh, uh, with this information we're putting out, and he's going to be working on another situation with golf cart people in here, which again is a traffic situation, of, of what amount of, <coughs> of traffic uh, citations as well. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Ray. Beth? Mobility Committee met on August 2nd, and one of, the, one of the first things that was discussed was what is our mission statement for this committee, and so, <laughs> so we appointed a committee um, led by Joan Millman, which will be reporting back at our next meeting. <laughs> In addition to this, um, Brad mentioned earlier that the um, on-demand services started this weekend, and we, we're going to heavily advertise it, and we will hopefully find out. We'll have a report back in four or five weeks of how this went, and hopefully we will be moving more to this on-demand type program on the weekends, which really ends up being a door-to-door -door service. Drew Harrell and Becky Johnson, Jackson, I'm sorry, both gave their reports, and something that the committee came up with, which really is kind of in line with, with our movement of being of um, being um, self-governing self is that we're really interested in what the data is that the staff is talking about. And so we asked each of them if they would, in their reports from now on, please include, first of all, a narrative 
of what the data is all about. Tell, tell us the story, the narrative of the story. Secondly, we'd like to see the trends in the data, what's really going on here so we can make a more informed decision. And thirdly, what are significant details that we should be aware of in helping us to make decisions? So those three things, both Becky and Drew will be working on when they present reports to the Mobility Committee from now on. Um, Becky Jack Jackson, who is in charge of marketing and advertising for transportation, has expanded the Tuesday shopping uh, um, uh, uh, offerings to the Irvine Spectrum, the Mission Viejo Mall, uh, Costco, and Walmart. So we're really moving on to other places where, where you can go shopping on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Every Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there's a shopping excursion. And last but not least, Bruce Hartley discussed putting together, and this is something that they're working on now, gave a sample to those of us on the committee and discussed a transportation resource guide. So we have our transportation system, and if whatever it is that we are offering doesn't meet your needs at that particular time, where else could you go to be able to get a ride? And so that's an, a resource guide that will be put together and be distributed in the community sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Judith. Um, part of the data that Beth is talking about, if you ride the buses, it's imperative that you remember to swipe your card. Because yes. that's some of the data that staff <coughs> collects and to decide if we want more or less transportation and more or less bus routes and are enough people riding the buses. And I know it's an inconvenience, especially for those with walkers and, and paraphernalia and bags, but I can't emphasize enough, you have to, to give us the more correct data, swipe your cards going on the bus. Thanks. Good point. All right, and there was no business planning committee meeting. So we are now at future agenda, which will be user fees for room rentals and golf, but that'll be discussed at the CAC meeting on Thursday. And whatever they come up with, we'll probably get to have the room full of lovely people on October. Um, so uh, we, are we are now at item 16, which is director comments. Director Beckett. Um, I want to respond to a comment that uh, the chair made about the reserve funds being audited. As far as I know, our reserves have never been audited, and I call for an audit of those reserves. Thank you. Our financial structure is audited. Richard, Catherine, Tom, Diane, Beth, Ray. Nothing, thank you. Joan. I just have to say, it's voting time. Uh, yellow is for third, pink is for united. Both um, elections are uncontested. At least 15% of the community has to vote, period, just to make the elections legal. But one of the reasons they throw out a ballot is if you forget to sign up here where the red X is. You have to sign your ballot or they will throw it out and not count it at all. That's very important. So please vote so we get at least that 15%. And don't forget to sign it. That's very important. Thank you. All right, I have no comments. This meeting is recessed. <laughs>